Regular Board of Ed meeting to order at 7 p.m. Invocation or moment of silence. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc will be late, so I'll be taking over. Let us take a moment to remember and honor and thank our brave soldiers this holiday season. May the spirit of the holidays bring you and your family hope, happiness, and love. The Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Fire evacuation announcement. Go out the double doors um, behind you, out to the parking lot. The side doors, my left, your right, go down the stairs and out to the parking lot. Roll call, please. Mr. LeBlanc. Mrs. Pickett. Ryder. Here. Mr. Ungeyer. Here. Mrs. Zakri. Here. Dr. Callanan. Here. Mrs. Cushman. Here. Mr. Hamry. Here. Madam Chair. Here. Co okay, item six, board guests. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have two very special guests to start us off tonight is Ms. Lori Gates and Ms. Pam Townsend to discuss our Wreaths Across America program, which is happening tomorrow. And that's all I'm going to say. I don't want to get in trouble. Yes, and the mic is not working for the, so you have to <laughs> have the cordless this evening. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be easy for you, Michelle. <laughs> okay. Is it good? Okay. Hi, I'm Pam Townsend, and this is... Yeah. <laughs> As you all know, that Lori and I work together in support of Wreaths Across America's mission, Remember, Honor, and Teach. And we're here about the teach portion of it tonight. However, we're going to talk a little bit about the why we do this. I work on the remember and honor part of the mission, and Lori works on the mission to teach our next generation. We do have some exciting news to announce, but before we make our announcement, we thought that we would share with you our why. Why do we volunteer year after year in support of this mission? For me, it is all about the veterans and their families. I don't know if anybody realizes it, but I am a 27-year veteran, so it, it does touch my heart a little bit more than um, most, maybe. I don't know. Um, but I won't allow personalities or politics to get in the way of my mission to remember and honor our veterans. We as a nation made a promise to our military and their families that we will never forget their sacrifices. I plan to keep that promise, so my why is to always remember and honor our veterans. And, re and Reads Across America helps keep me focused on my why. So thank you, and now Lori will share her why. Yay. <laughs> so everything Pam said and my part of Reads Across America, my why, is the teaching portion. And I'm happy to help Pam in any way that she needs me to, but... In an era of social media, I think that reaching the next generation becomes extremely important. And we use social media a lot of times to communicate and sometimes miscommunicate. So this uses a modality that the younger people are used to, and it brings us more together. Um, there's a quote by Ben Franklin that says, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. And this program brings to life the words of honor and sacrifice. And that's a lesson I think we should be carrying forward for our future. Um, the exciting part, maybe the first part of it is, um, tomorrow we are being graced with a seventh visit by the Reese Across America convoy trucks. They are here. They're over at Walmart. Um, this is a four tractor trailer shoot off of the main, um, convoy, which if you saw the news tonight, they were in New Britain earlier, and it's an enormous convoy. So these folks at Walmart pull off uh, once they get to New Hampshire, and they get to go to the schools because they want to further that mission of remember, honor, and teach. So uh, we used to go into schools to do it, and COVID happened. We had to have a little bit of a hybrid occur, and actually it worked out even better, I think, because Thanks to EPD and all of our town's first responders, we're going to have them pass every single public school tomorrow morning. So every school gets to be roadside. Every school is teaching what Wreaths Across America is about, why it's important. And so everybody gets to be a little bit of a part of it. And, and I think that 
I, I had asked some of the schools to send some videos or photos into Mr. Barasa to combine. And like I sat in my car and cried when I got an audio file of a fourth grade class saying the Pledge of Allegiance yesterday. <laughs> so so that that's your breakthrough moment. When you reach somebody and they understand why this is important, why it's important to remember our veterans, what sacrifice, what honor is. That's a message we're sending forward, you know, to a time that the rest of us aren't going to see. So I, I think that that's a really important lesson to give people. So tomorrow morning will be a little bit of noisy chaos. Um, they're starting off at 10 at Walmart and headed. There's a route. So I won't read it all to you, but they're hitting every single school, ending here at Town Hall at about 11 a.m. for a wreath laying ceremony with the Veterans Council. And then we'll get them some lunch and let them head off to Arlington where their, their next stop is. So um, everybody's welcome to come out along the route. Anybody at home listening, please come out. There's plenty of spots. I'll be posting the route again tonight. Um, they are very excited to be here. I'm texting with my contact and she's like, we're so excited. We love Enfield. We love what your town does. They only come back because of everybody else. So thank you. Let's continue that. And I'm done, if there's any questions. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, it's also on the Enfield patch, the, the route. We've been blasting across uh, social medias quite a bit. Um, but for everyone here in the council chambers and in TV land, I invite you to the National Wreaths Across America ceremony on December 17th at 12 p.m. And um, it's at St. Patrick's Cemetery. Um, I, in, I invite you not only to attend the ceremony, but to stay afterwards and honor our veterans to lay a wreath on, uh, by placing a wreath on one of their graves. Um, this is the first time in 15 years that we have received enough wreath sponsorship to honor every veteran in St. Patrick's Cemetery. And there were, we're talking 17, about 1,700. And we need help, um, we need your help to help place those uh, wreaths. We, um, we're hoping that after we finish placing them all, uh, that we do have some extras that we can go take to other cemeteries. It won't be much, but we're hoping to be able to do that. So um, I thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk here today, and I hope to see everyone on December 17th at St. Patrick's Cemetery. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions or comments? Mr. Ryder? Uh, so just a comment. Um, so to your point, um, we are as many schools um, that are along the route, and I believe it's all of them. Um, but if you do see your school listed, um, check your emails. I just want to remind our parents um, to bundle up tomorrow. It is very cold. Uh, this cold snap has hit us hard. And the students will be going out. Um, either to the end of their driveways or at least out in front of their buildings, depending on the structure, you know, where their buildings are in town, uh, to wave to these convoys. So we just wanted to remind the parents. I know I saw a few of those emails from some of the principals, but um, just anybody that's watching this, our kids will be going out to see this amazing event. I've been there uh, every year that you've had this here for us, and I thank you for that. I thank you both for that. Um, but I just want to remind the kids to bundle up tomorrow. It'll be very cold outside. <laughs> I might interject too. Speaking of that, we have um, fire, EMS, and police personnel from Enfield and Summers that are coming in and they're stationing at the schools so that they can sound their sirens and their lights and whatnot, get the kids amped up and in a form of a salute as they pass. So please, parents at home, there's no emergency at your school tomorrow. You can expect to see a lot of <laughs> first responders out there. <laughs> Ms. Pickett? Um, first, thank you both. Um, your dedication to your why is evident um, through the multiple things you do. It's not just Wreaths Across America that you do. So I just wanted to thank you both um, for your continued dedication to veterans in our community and the work um, that you do. Um, I love the deep co collaboration that's happening with our public schools with the Remember, Honor, and Teach piece especially. Um, I think that's really important. Um, I was going to give a reminder about dressing appropriately, encouraging anybody in town to come to 11 a.m. at the Town Green. A wonder that I have as a mom is I've gotten a few folks who have said, my kid wants to make a sign or do something like that. Um, can children bring in a sign or something to hold? Absolutely, yes. <laughs> the more bells and whistles and personal effects this is, the more impact it makes on all of their friends that are there also but then the convoy drivers see that and and one of the best compliments i think that that we've gotten is 
other people talking in Arlington saying, oh, you got to go to Enfield, Connecticut, so we've made our mark on them, you know, and, and taking this all together, and like, those are the wreaths that are headed to Arlington National Cemetery. You know, a lot of people get confused about our wreaths versus their, you know, what have you. So it really is headed to hallowed ground. And, and so using that as a teachable moment for the kids and getting them excited, best way to do it. So yes, please go out. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Hamry. Just thank you. That's it. <laughs> Ms. Acree. Simply thank you for all you do, all your hard work, and thanks for remembering and honoring the veterans of our country. Thank you. Okay, just a few things. Um, I was talking to Ms. Townsend at the Cookies for Camouflage event that you guys also hold, um, and I was saying how last year it was a, like a snowy day for the wreath ceremony. It was just a very symbolic with the how the snow was falling um, that day, and it was amazing to see how many community members come out and want to place the wreaths on the graves. Um, it's it's very heartwarming. Um, I know since COVID, we've opted for this new format, but I also love the way that we can involve every public school um, on the route. It's something to look forward to and the wreath drivers. Um, I do have a question. Who is riding in the convoy this year? Good question. So uh, COVID kind of has shut down riding in the trucks for a while. This year, they can take a couple people. So uh, Mr. Barrasso is going to be in one, so he can video past all these schools and catch all the kids with their signs and whatnot. Um, Lucian Lefebvre, Pam's husband, um, was put in. Mr. Dresick was going to ride in 2019, and then it, it's iced, so we had to cancel. So Lucian was going to ride in his place because that's what he wanted, and so this is a few years late, but we're going to have Lucian in one of the trucks. And because um, I like to do things last minute. Um, so Pam doesn't talk a lot about her service, but she was down in D.C. during 9-11, and that Shanksville truck is heartwarming because there's three trucks headed to Arlington, and then there's a shorter one that's headed to the 9-11 crash site at Shanksville that we get. So um, you're riding tomorrow morning <laughs> in the Shanksville truck. I know. <laughs> yes. Thank you for thank you for sharing um, that moment with us. And I went to a um, I, a service for someone who um, was getting buried with military honors, and Lucian was there at the Agawam uh, Cemetery. So um, I saw him there as well. So I want to thank you both for your service. I want to thank all the veterans for their service, and we are forever grateful. And I will be waving you to you tomorrow and Lucian and Guy and the drivers um, like many of us will tomorrow. So thank you again. Thank you. Thank you both. Item 6B. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I can't go say this enough that uh, as Ms. Gates mentioned that this is what our seventh time and I just hope people don't take it for granted because it happens every year but it doesn't happen in a vacuum it happens because of these um, two wonderful people here uh, and it usually I can now I figured out about when the announcements come because I get a message from Mrs. Gates that says guess what what are you doing on the 14th um, you don't have to tell me anymore I'm just going to assume but thank you both for for everything in the partnership and our kids have a blast and I did have the experience of driving in the convoy once um, so you're, you're crying now, <laughs> wait till you see them out there tomorrow. So, um, enjoy, you deserve it. Our next guest, um, not to be outdone, but sorry, Michelle, um, is our chief academic officer, Michelle Middleton, who's going to do a presentation on data. But before she begins and as she, uh, gets set up, I just want to sort of remind the board, um, what we've instituted since the beginning of this school year. So the very first meeting of the year that we had, um, we use that as an opportunity to define what the district's equity statement would be. And in turn, the board actually adopted that as your own and pleased to present that the town council actually jumped on that as well. 
Um, our next formal meeting that we had with the board, we did a presentation on our social emotional learning program that we had in the district, as you all recall. And we did that because like with the equity statement, a lot of people had their own definition of what it was. And I think it's important for you and for the members of the public um, to know you know, what definition, what we believe in, what, what we're working toward. Um, the next, as I had mentioned through one of our, um, my reports, is that, and, and this has kind of been a reoccurring theme, is the world has changed a lot, over, particularly over the last few years. Um, and I mentioned that there are some changes structurally around the district that we have to make in order to adapt to what our kids' needs are now. One of them is sitting in front of you. Um, and Ms. Middleton, who's always been our chief academic officer, but I'll use this opportunity to thank her because over the years, she has taken on a lot more things that maybe didn't have a direct connection to academics at times, and that's our fault, my fault. Um, but we needed to allow her to refocus um, on what what our kids needs academically were going to be particularly coming over the uh, coming out of the last few years um, the next time i had an opportunity to talk to you guys in, in this format um, you may recall i put some state data up on the screens um, to show the, you and the public um, who we were what were the makeup of our kids and it was the the, the the high needs data that i was able to obtain from this from ed site through the state of connecticut um, so that can really everyone can have an understanding about what the needs of our kids are um, the next phase in this rollout process is obviously what you're about to hear from Michelle now with our assessments from our state assessments over, over the past year, but also some other talking points that we wanted to make sure that the public was aware of and that you as board members are aware of. And I know some of you have, this is typically goes through the curriculum committee first, so some of you have already seen this, um, but it's important for the whole entire board to hear it and also the public and most importantly, what we're, what we're doing to address the needs of our kids. So that said, and I'll finish up with the last piece when Michelle is done. So I, have, I may interrupt you once, but I'll try not to. Okay, is this all right? Okay, um, so I'm here to talk about assessment scores, so I'm just gonna go on. Um, the first slide I have ha is a summarization of goal of a goals that we have as a district for this year um, for math and ELA. And ELA, when we talk about ELA and these state mandated tests, the, it is reading and writing combined. So sometimes you hear it reading, sometimes you hear it English, sometimes you hear ELA, that's why. Um, our district-wide goal is for all of our students in K-12 to show growth in the mastery of the skills and understanding of the standards of math and ELA as shown by their performance from the fall to the spring assessments. I should say that we're not judging this growth on the uh, solely, I mean, throughout the year, we will not be judging this growth based on the data I'm going to be showing you because those tests happen once a year. So how are we going to monitor the growth and the progress? we're going to use these assessments for the data monitoring. So we have um, iReady Math Diagnostic in grades K through eight. I'm sure most of you parents have heard about that. In the iReady Reading Diagnostic in K through five. Um, running records, K through five. Um, pre and post reading and writing unit assessments also happen K through eight. And at the high school, we have uh, district created common assessments for English and math. So English nine, 10, and 11 have common assessments, and math that goes by subject area, goes by algebra one, geometry, um, algebra two, pre-calculus, and, and therefore, so, and so on. So that's the data that we're looking at. Here's how we're looking at that data. We are, um, the, the department coordinators, teachers, building administrators, they meet regularly to review data and discuss next steps. They meet in department meetings, um, some professional development sessions, leadership meetings, and they have collaborative planning time at different levels as well. And they get in sometimes to talk about that as well. We also have reinstituted our student achievement meetings this year. So the elementary will come in three times a year, actually next week are our first ones with both of them. Primary will come in together and intermediate will come in together. And they will meet with at central office with Chris, Andy, myself. They will meet with the proper math, the, the well, Jay LeMay says K-12 math, and whoever the English, the reading coordinator is, because it's Adrian Snow K-2 and it's Deb Gaskell 3-5. And they have, I've already given them a list of the data that they bring to each of the meetings, what they bring in December, what they'll bring in March, what they'll bring in June. They have worked together to put together a um, PowerPoint presentation to present to us so we can look at all the data from all the schools at the same time. We can have discussions about what's working, you know, who, where, where are outliers, where is there more growth, where is there less growth, what is going on, and what our next steps are going to be. 
And then secondary principals, Andrew Berrios and Aaron Clark, they meet with me monthly. And starting in December, um, depending on the data calendar at the high school, different coordinators will be coming in with their data to do the exact same thing with Aaron and Andrew. In that case, though, the coordinators will present their department's data to us, both for 6 a and 9-12, and we will discuss um, next steps and what, what seems to be working, what needs um, some, some monitoring and interventions. Okay. So in this presentation, I have assessment scores for Smarter Balance, both ELA and math, that's given in grades three through, three through eight. SAT school day is grade 11, and yes, it is the regular, the reason it's called SAT school day is it is the, the regular SAT just without the writing portion, and the state has made that the mandated assessment for grade 11, and our students get to take that in school for free, um, and they can have their scores go to colleges, so that, that does happen in, March or April, I believe they give us a window in a March and a window in April. Next generation science uh, um, science assessments, they're given in grades five, eight, and 11. So that's not given yearly, it's given once at the intermediate, once at the middle, and once at the high. And then the graphs I have are gonna show you comparisons between us and the state. Cohort growth, well, ca comparisons between 2018, 19 and 2020, 122. So the year before the pandemic and last year's data. And then also comparisons, internal comparisons of ourselves between 2020, 2020 to 2021 and 21 and 22. The reason it's just internal is the state did not release that information publicly. Each district got their own. The state did not release state data. It just went to districts. So we can compare with ourselves basically. But I think it's good to look at the first year of testing after the pandemic and then what happened last year. Okay. So um, this is the Smarter Balance assessments for ELA grades three through five. EPS is blue and Connecticut is yellow. So I'm just going to let you look at that for a second. If I'm moving, if I move up slide too fast, just let me know. Um, this is math for three through five. And again, we are blue and what's the matter? Mm -hmm. okay. I, I was just going to yeah. share the clarification of the, the number, the, the percentage is students you. who meet or exceed. Yes, um, these are students that if your child received, thank you, if your child received their individualized report and they received a three or a four, they are in this percentage. Three is meeting and four is exceeding the expectations of the state. That's going to be on, that's the data for all of this. Um, and again, so we are blue and um, the state is yellow. Then we get to um, the middle school where it is um, ELA for 6-8, obviously, and the scores are right there. Math for grades 6 through 8. SAT school day, um, this is us compared to the state for, and again, it's just that one grade level that's tested at the high school. This is um, NGSS, the science assessment for grades five, eight, and 11, us versus the state. 11th grade did a pretty good job. Just throwing it out there. So this is comparing before the pandemic to last year, and this, this um, is able to be a cohort comparison. So the blue shows students that were in grade three in 2018, 2019, our last normal year. And the yellow is them in grade six last year. So ELA is on the left and math is on the right. This is the SAT school day. This cannot be a cohort comparison because again, it's only given once in grade 11, so you can't compare they don't take it again. <laughs> so um, this is just uh, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic for grade 11 students. In science, however, we were able to do a comparison because of the way the grades fall. So um, the first one on the left is the students in grade five pre-pandemic and grade eight last year. And on the right, it is the students in grade eight pre-pandemic and grade 11 last year. A 
Okay, th these next slides are a comparison between 2021, well, 2020, 2021, and 21 to 22. I do want to say we have to remember that in the year 2020 to 2021, we were hybrid. Um, we, they were in a couple days. They were home a couple days. And the other thing is there was remote learning. And the other piece was there was also remote testing allowed by the state, which they don't, they allowed that one time because so many schools were hybrid. So to get the testing in, they put in um, a remote testing option. So some students actually did test from home, not many, but some. So this is also a cohort comparison. The blue is the year uh, 2020 to 2021 and the yellow is 21 to 22. The first set of scores are when they were in third grade to fourth grade, fourth grade to fifth grade, and fifth grade to sixth grade, and these are ELA. Okay. Same kiddos, same grade level, same years, just math. Now we have um, six, eight. So, it's actually grade six um, to grade seven, grade, and grade seven to grade eight. And the same students for math. So just the different assessments, but same kids. I know that you already know that the SAT school day is not a cohort comparison, so I won't say it again. Um, but the blue is, tw is um, the, f the hybrid year, and the yellow is last year. And again, with um, a two-year comparison and the gaps in the science, um, these are not cohort comparisons, but the blue is um, the hybrid year, and last year is the yellow. Those are all the graphs. Now we get into the strategies that we're putting in place. So for English language arts, um, we're using the assessments that I mentioned at the beginning of the at the beginning of the presentation. I did I do outline some of them here as well. Um, that the, that data is used to help guide instruction at all levels, right? So teachers are looking at where the kids are and they're they are making adjustments to their instruction based on their students. Um, under K-5 I, I Ready Diagnostic, I talk about that the data informs Tier 2 and Tier 3 small group instruction. I want to clarify a little bit. Tier 1 instruction is for all students. That is the foundation. All students get best practices um, in instruction and includes dif differentiation. Tier 2 is um, students that need a little more support um, and the classroom teachers in the K-5 level, they pull students into small groups to work on the skills that they need help on, and they group the kids by common areas of weakness. And that usually, that, that instruction will take place two to three times a week. Tier three is a more intensive targeted intervention and support, and that is students are um, they receive that support by the language arts consultants in the building. Now, the tier two and tier three instruction does not replace tier one instruction. It just supplements it. It does not supplant it. So that those are the different types of supports. So I just wanted to kind of lay that out there a little bit for you. Um, we also have MyPath, which is part of the iReady. Once they take the diagnostic, MyPath kind of tells the kiddos, like it, it assesses where they are. And if I go on, I have my own personalized instruction based on my scores and what I, what I did well on and what I did not do well on. And it meets me where I am and it, it supports me and, and brings me up further in my, in my, um, in my learning. Um, we've already talked about the pre and post um, right reading and writing assessments. We're also using um, a another tool from Ready, which is growth monitoring assessments in grades one through five, and those are used four times a year. They, they are given in months where they are not taking the diagnostic. So it's just another assessment to put in, to put in between to kind of assess students' learning. Um, LLI is an intervent is a reading intervention level literacy intervention and that is a tool that we are in year two of using in our tier three instruction for our for our reading students. 
This is the first year that all K2 buildings are using the Hegarty Phonics program to help support and supplement their, their reading instruction at the K2 level. And then the model of teaching in all of our ELA classes, K through 12, is that it allows time for student practice and application of the skills that the teacher has presented that, to them. So they, they can work in class on those, on those items while the teacher is going around either working with a small group or supporting the students as they are applying the skills. Math has the iReady diagnostic as well and the MyPath, it just has it in K8, whereas reading is only K5. The, the, the tier two and tier three and tier one, it is the exact same structure. The only difference in math is that math consultants deliver tier three instruction. Um, and what we're doing this year too, uh, Jayla Mesa spent a lot of time over the summer with some teachers doing some work on the prerequisite skills, which I already kind of lays out for you, which what skills students need to um, to be able to understand to get to their next grade level material. And so we're using that as a proactive approach to make sure students are all ready for access to grade level material. So prerequisites, that's a tier one, and that's a tier one strategy for all students. And these are skills that students have already been exposed to in prior grades, but it's a check in their understanding because they have to understand that skill to be able to, to, add, to effectively access the grade level material. And an example of that is a student has to have mastered or understand place value in order to move on to two digit addition. So, that's a, so if you're going to, into a two digit addition unit, place value would be the prerequisite skill that you're going to review tier one with all of your students. And then what you do is, if for example, I'm having a harder time catching on, that might be my tier two focus by the classroom teacher before we get to that unit. So um, that's something that we're doing at the K-8 level. They're actually also doing it in ninth grade because the last bullet talks about the fundamental math, focus on, focuses on the upcoming skills in Algebra 1, and the students that are in fundamental math are reviewing those prerequisite skills so they can be successful in Algebra 1. Jay has also implemented some new um, assessments at the high school level for check-ins and practice for students. So. Algebra 1 and Geometry have weekly tar targeted spiral review assignments that are completed in Delta Math, which is a new program that we have. It takes them step by step through the problems. And Algebra 2 and Pre-Calculus are using West, uh, weekly SAT assignments that they complete in Ingenuity. So, somebody doesn't like Delta Math. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if it was a fan or not a fan. Excellent, thumbs up, I like thumbs up. Excellent, oh good, excellent, thank you. I saw it in action last week, and I thought it was pretty good, too. Um, so we're on to next steps. And I'm sure one thing stuck out to you, which I didn't mention as we went through. Um, grade 8 scores took a dip in all three subject areas. So the question is, what factors impacted grade 8 last year? Um, and I have a couple of bullets underneath. This is where I get to interrupt. Um, I wonder. So I want to mention this tonight because it's been publicly reported recently about chronic absentees and data that's been released by the state of Connecticut. Um, so I know it wasn't in time for her, for Michelle to include that. And I had gotten a few questions from some of you, some board members about how our absentee resident rate is, is, is calculated this year. So do you know district wide? I, I'm asking I two ways. What was our district chronic absentee rate level pre-pandemic? Pre-pandemic as a district, it was 10%. And what is it currently? 21 last year. Okay, last year. Mm -hmm. What was JFK's pre-pandemic? JFK's pre-pandemic was 8.4. What was it last year? 32.9. Okay, I want to pause there for a second. I'm mentioning this because this is not the first time I said this in this room or at this dais. That 32% of JFK does not differentiate why those kids were absent. So when, and I have a personal philosophical difference with the state of Connecticut on how they calculate that, and I have let my feelings be known to the commissioner and the commissioner's um, entire uh, 
breasts, um, as well as a lot of my colleagues. And the reason for that is what happened during last year and the year before that may be a contributing factor as to why everyone's chronic absentee numbers are so high. So how many people in this room were known over the last two years were considered a close contact of someone who was a positive COVID case? It's hypothetical, but rhetorical. Um, we all were. How many, prior to last spring, does anybody recall what the requirements, not by us, but that what we were responsible to carry out the requirements as being a close contact of a positive COVID case? You had to quarantine for 10 days. Well, if you're a student in a classroom and you got quarantined twice by us, and when I say us, meaning the state of Connecticut, meaning the State Department of Education and the State Department of Public Health, created the guidelines that we had to adhere to on the quarantine measures. So don't blame Nurse Jess and the crazy flow charts that we've seen over the last couple of years. We didn't create that, but we were responsible for implementing that. If you're a student, and I'll pick on our student reps, and you were exposed twice, you are chronically absent, and you run the risk of losing credit because we would have kept you home for 20 days. I also want to take a step back because it is relevant to, and, and we don't have hard data at this point, but we'll find it. When we look at the impact of what happened in grade eight last year, and one of the things that you know we have to address. And again, I know there's going to be some people who think that, well, you're just using COVID as an excuse. I'm not trying to infer that. But we have to look at this through a realistic lens. If we were keeping kids home, and the data shows our absentee numbers are wicked high, we know why in the state of Connecticut, and part of the, uh, the argument that I had with the state was, no, we understand that those numbers are really skewed a bit because that includes COVID, that includes quarantine. But an absence is an absence, so we're still going to calculate it this way. I, that didn't sit well with me or my colleagues, and we fought the good fight, but we didn't win. It's in there. But in that 38% that's at JFK, that doesn't differentiate what was a COVID, what was a quarantine, or what was an actual truancy. Um, nonetheless, we will be you know, zapped by the state because our chronic absentee numbers are so high. However, the reason that those numbers are so high is because we were sending kids home because we had to, because the state told us that's what we had to do. Again, I'm not pointing fingers. I just, people need to know, the, you know th this through a realistic lens. The other thing that does have an impact that we do need to talk about was when we sent, a pick on you, Caleb, when we sent you home for 10 days, during that, Michelle had referenced the hybrid year. What we couldn't do last school year was if I sent you home for 10 days, and these are real life conversations I'll share with you that I have with parents, was you can go home. Thank you for telling us that you were exposed. Thank you for being honest and upfront. I sat in this thing and begged people, just be honest with us. If you have it, we'll, we'll do the best we can. If we send you home, what was different last year than in the previous year was two things we couldn't do any longer, remote learning or dual instruction, because it was illegal. And if anybody wants to verify whether or not the legality behind remote instruction, I'll pick on you, Morgan. Do you remember what happens on PSAT days for seniors at Enfield High School? We sit in the auditorium. Okay. Or you are excused absence if you have a college visit or a job to, or a, a, you know, a, a career counseling day or something along those lines because seniors don't take PSATs. During the hybrid year, we had made an announcement because we were still doing asynchronous learning because that was approved and legal um, that we let seniors know you don't have to come to school on PSAT day. You can use that as an asynchronous learning day. Last year, we sent out the message to seniors a few days prior to PSAT day that you essentially we sent the same message out by accident. Within one hour, I got a call from the commissioner's office that says what you're doing in Enfield High School is illegal. And when I explained, what are you talking about? When, and realized, oh no, they just didn't change the message from last year. It was okay, we weren't in trouble, but it took one hour for the state to realize, if you do any kind of remote learning, you're breaking the law. So when you look at these figures and you realize, kids aren't in school, what weren't they getting when that absentee number is so high? What, they weren't just missing being in school, what were they missing? They were missing instruction. 
and it was, and there was nothing we can do about it. Now I got to commend our teachers because when we sent you home for ten days, we would tell you, you still have access online through your through your devices. Your lessons will be posted. Your assignments will be posted. And if you have any questions or concerns, your teacher will get back. You know, email your teacher. They will get back to you as soon as they can. But nothing, nothing can supplement a real time instruction from a teacher. I use my own kids because I get this a lot from parents. You know. It, it, a lot of parents are unhappy with this. They, you know, they would call them. These are real conversations. There's two examples I'll give you. One parent called and said, listen, my son played a basketball game yesterday. I just got a call on Monday morning. Just got a call on Sunday night from the coach that said there was a positive COVID case. What do I do? Thank you for calling us. Thank you for being honest. Because a lot of parents just look the other way. But unfortunately, under the rules, you got to quarantine for 10 days. Understand, what does this mean for my kid's school? Well, I explained what I just explained. So wait a second. Why can't my kid just dial in the class and not miss out on anything? Unfortunately, that's the law. That's the rules. You can't. It's illegal to have remote learning and it's illegal to do dual instruction. That's the only thing we're technically allowed to offer. I often get, well, that's OK. But if it were your kid, <laughs> you wouldn't be happy with this. Understandably, this actually happened to my own kid. <laughs> my daughter, who was a freshman in high school last year, was exposed to COVID. No symptoms, wanted to go to school, but I said to my daughter, you know, if for some reason you end up with it and they contact trace it back to a superintendent's kid as a super spreader, that's not going to be a good look. So unfortunately, kiddo, you got to stay home more than once. And I, another, how many of you woke up in the last two years with a scratchy throat or congested? And the first thing you thought of was, I got it. We beg people, please. Stop the, the, the don't don't if you're sick, stay home. But we couldn't offer them real time instruction because it wasn't permitted. So and I'll just finish up on that, because this is one of the biggest questions that I will get. And you guys will ultimately get to at the end of the year. Some of you got them last year. All of those days that people did the right thing and either stayed home or reported that they were exposed and missed out. I knew as a parent that my child wasn't going to have the same level of understanding and success academically. She's not the kid. She, she thrives in a regular classroom with real time instruction. I knew there was going to be a sacrifice for that, but we were trying to do the right thing to keep her home. That happened more than once throughout the year. Guess what my kid got is the same thing where a lot of parents are watching this tonight. They got the letter. I got the letter. And I know what it feels like to get the letter because immediately you think you're a terrible parent. Your kid's truant and you're going to miss credit because you kept your kid home from school. And on the letter, it says the days where your kid was absent. And I knew that the reason my kid was absent all those days is because I was trying to do the right thing to keep my kid home. It doesn't matter. The state requires us to send that truancy letter home. Now, we have a little bit of leeway when it comes to missing credit and things like that. That is within our judgment. But my point to all this is. What I couldn't replace for my own kid and for some of these kids that we were forced to keep home was nothing will replace real time instruction with a teacher. So when we look at numbers like, you know, our absentee rates, there is a legitimate you know, fallout from that. But when you look at it, it can't just be, well, you got to do a better job getting your kids at school. For this particular year, we were forced to keep kids out of school. And we didn't have the same tools that we had the previous year to say, look, I know you got to be home. Dial in on your iPad. At least you can get some FaceTime with your teacher. I got to commend our teachers. They did the best they could and they went above and beyond answering questions. But if you're in a math, you know, you're in a geometry class and you have a problem right now at 10 in the morning when you're doing it and you send an email to your teacher and your teacher responds back at two because they have a job to do, something's going to get lost in translation. And that's what happens. And I just think people need to realize what the realistic world that we lived in over the last couple of years, what the real fallout of what everyone has experienced had to do with our kids. We said this from the minute we closed school on March 13, 2020. This is going to be a generational issue. You know, we know kids that are referred to. Some of you may be baby boomers or Gen Xers. COVID kids is going to be a real thing. And that's not going to be a stigma, but it's going to be what what happened to our kids during this time. So that's why when I'm glad Michelle mentioned we're not just focusing on just the standardized tests here. We're we're focusing on growth because we just got them back. And what are we going to do to make the, their needs, make sure that we're meeting their needs 
because their needs are not the same today as they were two years ago, three years ago when they left. I think I covered everything. Sorry, Michelle. Um, my back. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other thing, this is not a question and it's not anything that would have impacted grade eight. It's something that happened this year is a new team was added for grade eight at the middle school. Um, teams, there were four teams, four teams, four sixth grade, four seventh grade, and there's been three eighth grade for a number of years. And with the opening of the new building in the space, a fourth team was added. So that will impact this year with class sizes and you know coordinating of teachers and alignment and things like that so that is a positive i forgot one other thing because I'm, I'm fixated like a lot of you are on what happened in grade eight we also have to remember we're talking about absenteeism and we're talking about quarantining what did the vast majority of our eighth graders do during last school year where did they live when they were at jfk they lived in what's called a swing space either in the old cafeteria or the old library and that part of the facility of the building was built to keep as many kids as we can fit in a classroom while the wings were demolished and rebuilt. That was designed in 2019. The swing spaces at JFK were not designed when something called social distancing was a thing. So a lot of our kids were in those rooms, which the fallout with that is if there was a positive COVID case in that classroom, the likelihood of quarantining was greater for a larger group of kids because they were closer in proximity, but we had nowhere else to put them. We did the best, believe me, our nursing staff, our teachers, everybody went above and beyond to social distance, mask, keep everybody away to stop spreading this thing. But the reality is if there was more kids in a classroom, in all likelihood, more kids had to quarantine, which in turn could have created that fallout of more kids are out of school and in turn less face time instruction, which have an impact on how our scores for that eighth grade. That's, I forgot about the classroom, sorry. Okay, um, so because we are asking questions about eighth grade, we have to actually, they are now in ninth grade. So what are we doing for our ninth grade students now? What interventions are we putting into place? So we are, um, coordinators are working with their teachers on um, differentiation and tiered interventions, um, looking at tier one and making sure that there is differentiation within it, within the classroom. Um, Erin Clark and I talked and she also is going to explore reintroducing transition supports such as something called Fresh Start Check-In at EHS and that is when um, the administration and the counselors look at the ninth graders that are struggling and they divide the kids up and they each take a caseload and they meet regularly with those kids, check in with them, just make sure that they're getting the support that they need. So it's an extra person at the high school looking out for a struggling ninth grader to try to help them be successful. So, and then the last piece I have is the department coordinators, which are all K-12 now. Um, so they are, they're, they're gonna continue to be a consistent process, consistent presence in the classrooms at all levels to see what is happening with instruction. What do our teachers need? What do the kiddos need? It, what's working, what's not working? What can we take from one classroom or one even content area and bring to another to improve that tier one instruction? They're also working with the secondary um, class teachers during their department time and their PD sessions. They have department time at least once a month, sometimes twice with each of their um, JFK and um, Enfield High folks. They um, alternate between faculty meetings. So when, when JFK has a faculty meeting, Enfield High has a department meeting and vice versa. They're working with their K-5 teachers during flex blocks times and there's some collaborative meeting times that they're invited in as well. And they're working with teachers at all levels on instructional strategies that will increase student engagement and or increase the mastery of student skills. This is the tier one piece, right? So we have to look at how to make it as effective as possible. So one of the things I'm talking to them about is looking at the initiatives we had in place before the pandemic that were working and making a difference. And now, are they in place now? Because some of them, social distancing, hybrid learning, it, it, they didn't translate. So if they were working before, is it something we can bring, is it in place now? Why, why not, should it be? And then the other thing is, as Chris has said, reevaluating the students in front of us and what they need and what will work for them. And the last thing that um, the department coordinators are gonna continue to do is work with the building administrators to help implement school-wide goals and mission. It's really important that everybody's on the same page so that teachers are hearing the same message and so the coordinators are doing, um, following the vision of the school. 
which aligns to the vision of the district before you ask. Um, that's, that's what I have. I'm going to cut you off now before you get to questions. Just to wrap up the other next step. Um, just based on the last piece that Michelle mentioned, that our department coordinators are all K-12 now. We talked earlier about sort of the, the phases that led up to tonight's presentation, doing some restructuring district-wide to meet the needs of our kids now. In addition to being all K-12, they're all 12 months now. The other thing that she left out, but I could say is, now all of our department coordinators report directly to Michelle. So we had to realign the staff that we had to meet the needs of the kids that we're having, that, the, the needs that our kids are having today. Um, and lastly, before we get into your questions, this was the sort of the fifth step of this phase of rolling out how our new reality is to you as I started this with before Michelle spoke. The last culminating piece of this is our budget, or at least the budget that I'm gonna present to you hopefully in January, if not February. I always say that because you don't know what the weather's gonna do. Um, that said, it's gonna look a little different than it's looked in the past because we now know where our priorities are. We have a better, if someone had asked this, well, what are you gonna do to, to assess you know, what we've been through over the last couple of years? We couldn't do that until we knew where our kids were. So we had to identify who our kids were, we had to identify what they've been through, in the areas of focus. That budget is going to reflect the needs of our kids. And it may not look, if those of you are looking for just a spreadsheet again, you're gonna be disappointed. But um, I think when we talk about making structural institutional changes around here, this is the big part. We need to put our money where our mouth is and put our money behind what we're doing to help our kids. So that's the culminating part of the entire structure that I've been rolling out secretly since September. Um, and I wanna thank Michelle, cause I know she's had many a sleepless nights trying to figure out why each number went in a different direction. And I've had to tell her the same thing I've told you guys, and I'll pick on Mr. LeBlanc cause he said this once before during another meeting. We can't look at it the same way anymore. It's almost like a reset. We can't look, okay, well, this was like this 10 years ago. 10 years ago, the world was a much different place. And now we have hard proof as to what our kids went through and how it affected them. What I'm worried about is what are we doing next? Michelle is a, a very, um, she's gonna get mad at me for saying this, um, type A person where she, but she wants to know in front of her and, and she's, she's getting better at it. And that's, that's a compliment, Michelle. Um, but we all have to start thinking a little bit differently around here. And I commend Michelle for doing that and coming from a different place and also having the direct line of all of our coordinators who are kind of in different roles now being in 12 months and being K, all K-12 to really set forward in motion the changes that we need to make. So that said, I'll shut up. Now it's questions for you guys. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone have any, I know Ms. Cree, you had a question, but if you're not ready to start, does anybody else have any comments or questions or? Ms. Pickett? Sorry. I wanna start with a thank you, Michelle. You can put your mic down. Um, I know that I have been a pest about this presentation and about this conversation um, for a very long time. And your efforts, um, A, on this presentation and your description of the efforts for Enfield Public Schools was incredibly clear, transparent, it was facts. Um, and I just wanna thank you for that because I think that's really important. Um, and you put up with me, so I really appreciate that. Um, I have, I think, since before even joining the board as a parent, I would come and speak about our data to some of you. Um, so this is like where I'm excited that we're having this conversation, but I'm sitting here wanting to know how can we be helpful. So I, um, in the mindset that we can no longer admire the problem, we know that COVID has impacted our students and staff, construction, the multiple transitions of our students, um, and, we need solutions. So it sounds like we have some great efforts in place. Um, with that being said, I do have some wonders. I don't expect any answers from you tonight. So really turn off your mic, you're off the hook. <laughs> um, I am it's more of me to share in, as something maybe for Chris to reflect on, on that budget presentation. I'd be love to see more than a spreadsheet because um, I think it's important for us to understand the needs and the ways and paths forward. Um, so with that being said, having an understanding of our needs and staff and how can we as a board support and advocate for those needs and the appropriate supports and funding 
funding. Um, I guess what I'm looking for is our district roadmap. Um, how is it that we are supporting our teachers? What is it and how can we share it so everybody can be on the same page? Because um, it's going to take more than just you. When we talk about chronic absence, it's a family partnership, it's a community partnership. Um, so how can we get everybody on board to, to support those efforts moving forward? I agree with you, Michelle. We have a clear tier one issue. Um, I'm an advocate for tiered interventions, um, but the way our data looks, we cannot intervene our way out of this problem. Um, so I think having a better understanding, especially about the structure of supports for our teachers, the last thing I want to do is put something else on the plate of a teacher um, or place blame on a teacher. Um, so thinking about how do we support them, think of the department coordinators, those structures that I'm excited to hear more about, um, I think that's going to be really important to highlight. Um, as far as the tiered interventions, I'd love to better understand um, how we're identifying those students for intervention, how those interventions are matched to those skill needs, and how families are aware of that process. So how is it working? As a mom, we get those iReady scores home, and I will tell you, when families got them home this year, it was like, is your kid there? Is your kid there? And we're all like comparing scores, and we're like, oh, we're all in the same boat. But there was a sense of like panic. Um, so thinking about how can we partner and ensure families are aware of that as well. Um, I mentioned not wanting to put more in the the shoulders of staff, so thinking about how can we actually lighten the load, which might sound really weird, um, but what are our priorities and how do we lift those um, with a clear plan so we can maybe take some of those other things off the plate. Um, I was happy to see you mention attendance there. I'm, I have a lot of wonders about the other data too, things like office discipline referral or, di or, or discipline um, in school and out of school suspension numbers, access to our school-based health centers, so thinking about mental health supports. Um, there's lots of needs and those two, so the SEL presentation that Chris referenced earlier, how do our behavioral supports and our academic supports really um, come together to support our students? And again, I just want to thank you. The presentation was thoughtful, um, a lot to reflect on. And I think we should, there's obviously something that's working. There was growth from 2020, 2021 to 2021, 2022, which is surprising because kids are tested at that next grade level. So if they didn't get good prerequisite skill instruction the previous year, the fact that they grew is actually pat yourself on the back there. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you, and know that we're here to support what is needed um, to support our students. Thank you. I will speak, thank you. Michelle, I just wanna thank you for your very informative presentation. Um, yes, the data shows where our students are, and all we can do, I think, is to move forward as Chris and you have said, by meeting them right where they are, coming up like you in your presentation show, have shown, coming up with the learning strategies and the special curriculum that will meet the needs of the students right now um, so they can start progressing. I do have faith in you, the teachers, the staff, administration for our district that our students will grow that they will get to master those skills, but it's going to take time. Um, my question was, what was the retention rate um, in our district? I actually know that. Well, part of that. So K-8, it was um, low, and I will reach out to each individual building, and I can bring that to you in the January meeting. Um, I do know the percentage of after summer school, the percentage of ninth grade students that were retained was 10.7. The um, number of 10th grade summer school students retained was 10.43. And the number of 11th grade retentions was 3.69%. Um, so summer school helped some students, but that's what it's there for, credit recovery is there to recover credits and move to the next grade level. Um, there were no retentions in 12th grade. Okay. last year. So, um, but I want to flip that data because when I was looking at that data and I was looking at the accountability index, I looked at the graduation rate. So um, the four-year graduation rate, which one's ours? Okay. The four-year graduation rate before the pandemic, the last year, 18, 19, and the four-year graduation rate means that first-time ninth graders graduated high school in four years or less. And that's all students that they, they count you know, high needs, non-high needs. Um, we were 89.6 before the pandemic. We were 91.1 last year, 
and that was higher than the state. We were higher than the state both years, actually. Um, and actually, even our six year high, our six year graduation rate, and what that does is it looks at, and these are these are actually um, a year behind because they'll report out the 21 cohort and the 21 20 to school year because they need time to actually adjust the data. It's not ready for them to go into ed site when they pull it and they start looking at things. Um, six year means um, ninth graders that get out in six years or less, but that only counts for high needs students. Mm -hmm. So, but that rate went up too. We were 81.2 before the pandemic. We ended up at 85% last year for our 20, uh, for our 19 cohort, because they needed two more, you know, it was two more years. Um, so we were above the state. The state was 88 and 89.6% for four years. So we were above the state both years. And we were just, we were a couple points below the state for six year before the pandemic, but we were pretty much right there with them last year. So those are, that's positive numbers. Yes. So, but I will get you the other numbers for our next meeting. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Just to remind Michelle, when it comes to retention, just to everyone's attention, during the pandemic, for K-8, we weren't permitted to retain students. Right. Recall when we had shut down, there was automatic advancement that was directed from the state too. So that may skew some of the figures as well. That is, that is true. <laughs> Mr. LeBlanc? I also told him that we spoke about the absenteeism, so he's gonna, he'll catch that on the... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate you all. I'll, <laughs> and this maybe relates, and if it does, just tell me, mm -hmm. go back and watch tomorrow, and, and I will. <laughs> and I apologize for being late. But um, you spoke of all I got before going back and watching it was the last slide of what you were presenting. Mm -hmm. um, and you mentioned how struggling, specifically ninth graders, are then grouped into caseloads that are um then tracked throughout the year to try to get them on on the right track um with that now i don't know if it's just ninth ninth or all other three remaining grades on top of ninth grade but what can you highlight or explain what the what the solution is from our standpoint on a lot of struggling students mm -hmm. has to do with the absentee rate of their attendance at school. So right. if they're struggling, it's more often than not, their attendance goes along with that. So what are we doing as a district to try to get in touch with those students? Mm -hmm. Not only get in touch, but get them back in the school building and back in the school building on a consistent basis. I know when I was over at Holyoke Public Schools, that was a huge issue. Um, there, there was a, a grand list of, of students that needed to be tracked down. And I'll be honest with you, it's, it's, I was not involved with it directly, but it seemed very hard to do so. So what, what are our strategies or solutions to that here? Okay, so um, every school has an attendance team and they meet depending they meet either bi-weekly or like they either meet every other week or like once a month at the elementary level maybe depending on where the attendance the the absences are if they're high they meet um more often the high school i'm pretty sure break weekly correct they have a team that meets weekly and they review all attendances they contact families they've gone out and done home visits so they're they've gotten youth um well used to be youth services, social services involved to help with that work. So they, they, the high school does a lot. And the reason they're focused on the ninth grade this year is because of the eighth grade drop. They wanna make sure they just have an extra adult that's checking in on them to get them any supports that they need um, because we're not really sure um, what, what, what caused, whether it was, you know, behavioral issues, mental health issues, lack of learning time. So they want to be, make sure that they, if the administrators and the counselors have a small caseload of kids, because they're not doing the whole ninth grade, they have a small caseload of kids that they can like make a personal relationship with and be the person that checks in with them, it, they found success with that in the past. But there are definitely, um, in, like at the elementary level, the primary level, they'll use FRC to help them reach out to families. So every single building has an attendance team that meets regularly and reviews. Ms. Cushman? 
Hi, Michelle. Hi. I'm thankful for the last two curriculum subcommittee meetings to have been able to attend and just be able to hear this now for the third time and with all the things that you've tweaked along the way. But there was one thing, question I just wanted to clarify. The um, next generation science assessment for the grade 11, their scores were very good. And I yes. know that there's something that's already in place in the high school that influences this. Could you explain what that is? I, I think part of it is um, a few years ago, several years ago now, um, Chris Ponte came before the board and he proposed putting together pathways of courses, both if you entered at like an honors level or if you entered at, you know, the college career prep level. So that what he did was he organized classes in this pathway so that by the time all students reach grade 11, they had exposure to all of the standards that are being assessed on the NGSS because what it does is in grade five, it assesses what they've done in three, four, five. Grade eight, it's what they've done in six, seven, eight. In grade 11, it's nine, 10, and 11 standards. So Chris really, um, thoughtfully put that together. He's also, um, he and his teachers have, have worked together to really um, look at um, increasing the student engagement in their class and performance-based assessments and just how their kids are accessing the material. And I think, I personally believe that that played a huge part in it, just his setup of it. And now, because it's been several years, we're really seeing that, that pay off, I think. But yes, it, it is noticeable. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. Mr. Ongeyer. Thank you, Michelle. And a uh, couple, couple of questions. Um, so I saw that your presentation highlighted absenteeism, absenteeism as just being a, a major contributing factor, right? Um, our, and, and then the superintendent mentioned things like swing spaces and as other contributing factors. Are you aware? Are you aware of um, other contributing factors other than absenteeism, other than swing spaces? Do you think uh, there are other contributing factors? I, I would guess that um, middle school being the formative years that they are, that if you are were a student that went in sixth grade and started middle school and got sent home in March for the rest of your year, and then went back the following year a couple days a week with smaller group sizes and then came all back together in eighth grade. I, it even came into seventh grade, like going back to middle school last year for, for full for everybody, but I would think especially eighth grade. Um, I would think that it's a social year. Those are social years and I'm not, I, I'm not sure kids I think they forgot how to socialize a little bit, like working together and communicating. And I, I do know that um, I've heard that there's a New York Times article <laughs> that shows that this is nationwide for grade eight as well. It's not just us, it's statewide. I mean, the state's numbers have dropped as well. Um, so I'm not sure if the mental health and social health piece plays a part of it. I don't know. I taught middle school for years. I'm familiar with how much they change from the beginning of a middle school year to the end of it, both physically and emotionally and behaviorally. So I don't know if that impacted them. I, I don't know. I do know that I think last year, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think all of our secondary kiddos had a harder time coming back into the normal everybody there than the elementary kids for, you know, I think, and I think the socialization plays a big part in it. I do. Okay. You, you explained well the uh, tier one and the tier two uh, what, could you could you explain just quickly the tier three? What's the difference between tier two and tier three? Sure, tier two is is when you don't need you need some support, but not intensive and targeted. It is less frequent, and it is often has a few more kids in the group. Tier three is your, supposed to be your smallest number of, of kids. It's kind of like a pyramid, right? So tier one's on the bottom is a big foundation. Tier two is the next chunk of kids. It's smaller. And then tier three is at the top, and it's the smallest. And those are the kids that are really going to need a really small group, probably four days a week. And they're going to need, inter they get progress monitored regularly. Um, the teacher's teaching and monitoring and assessing and making sure. But it's targeted, and it's intense. So that's, that's kind of the difference. I, I don't know if it makes, it's, it's more support. 
No, right now, thank you, and I understand now what okay. your three is. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I just didn't. I didn't get that during the presentation. And I, the last question, I just have one last question. Is I, I saw I saw the comparison between um, us and the state. Okay, yes. where we are today. All right, going back before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, not just the year before, right. but, you know, some some history before the pandemic. How did Enfield compare in scores to the state? We, um, in some areas, depending on the year, were higher. And in some, we were right on average. And in some, we were lower. I think there was less of a gap. So sometimes we were on the high end of the gap and they were lower than we were. It was more... We, I wouldn't say that we were beating the state all the time. I, I can't really sit here and say that. But the gap was a lot less when we weren't. And I know that for SAT, for example, I know that we beat them um, for SAT in English. Um, a few years we were above them. Um, we've always been really strong in the 11th grade um, science as well. And the elementary ELA and, and math were, were, um, were right up or above them. I said that was my last question, but I did just spawn one other okay. question. <laughs> um, and it goes back to contributing factors. Are you looking are, are you looking at all at like the area of curriculum? Yes. We made changes before the pandemic in our math curriculum and we were seeing progress at our elementary math curriculum. We were seeing progress and I think that that's why when someone maybe I think Amanda might have said that um, Mrs. Pickett, sorry, um, might have said that there was growth. I think that that curriculum helps sustain some of that. Um, so yes, we have been looking at that, absolutely. Okay, great, yep. great, thank you. Dr. Kalman? I just want to get back to the tiers. You said tier four is the most... Tier three. Uh, just, <laughs> There's no tier we, we don't have those. <laughs> <laughs> tier three. I know, not yet, we don't have tier four yet. Maybe I Ever. need some <laughs> tier three support in mathematics. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so you said that could be up to four days? Four days, yes. So uh, all students, mm -hmm. regardless of their tier level, get tier one, correct? Right. So is that going to eat into their tier one? No, it does not. What that Those students are um, taught by a, a consultant, either language, arts, and math. And that time, is you, they're usually pulled out of the classroom when the classroom teacher is doing the tier two intervention. So, on, and the students that don't need intervention are working on grade level material or, or other other things in, in like stations or reading whatever they're supposed to be doing. So the small group work is um, done outside of the chair one instruction. Actually, you may not pull a student from, from the grade, because tier one is the grade level material. And you, you can't pull the students from that, because if they miss that, then the tiers aren't going to work. You're welcome. Well, thank you. Um, I can end to this great presentation. I just wanted to share something because we were talking about the math numbers. Um, I went to—I was going to save it for my board member comments, but I'm going to message uh, mention it now. I went to the family engagement day at Prudence Crandall, and I was in a fourth grade class. And what they were working on at that time was math. And um, the fun way the kids were able to sit and practice math, like one of the games was where you put the headband on and you had to solve the equation on your head and um, I am not good at fractions, and that's the first table I sat down at, and so um, I struggled a little bit there, but um, also the way the kids have learned math as compared to the way I've learned math, especially with long division. Um, but I love the fact that we have teachers that are thinking outside the box and really making learning of math fun. Um, I think I said it in the curriculum meeting, you know, math is practice, and it's constant over and over and over again. and. You know, when we talk about pre-COVID and post-COVID and, and try to pinpoint it, um, yeah, there was so much going on from week to week. The kids didn't know if their whole class was going to be out, if we were going remote. Um, you know, that was a really um, big struggle on the teachers because the teachers felt at that time, you know, they kept saying, you know, we feel like we're failing um, the kids. And, um, you know, if teachers had to be out, then kids were getting substitute teachers. So it, it was definitely a balance. Um, but I agree. It's, it's time to look forward, recognize what we have. I think the whole world's changed post COVID. So some of us have changed, you know, the kids changed and, um, I think we're doing a good job of recognizing the needs. Um, it's interesting what we said about, um, 
district coordinators. Um, when I first started on the board, we actually had district district coordinators like K five. Mm -hmm. six, yes. eight, and, or six, 12. Um, and through the years with attrition and people retiring, um, they were expanded into like a K-12 type model. So I, I'm sure that's part of the challenge. Um, and I also think the emotional and mental health really took a toll um, on the students. As we saw, I think with um, the older kids, the kids in um, six through 12. Um, and I think that was part of the behavioral struggle we were seeing um, at that grade level. Um, but I, I'd like, it's an, an exciting time to see where we can go. Um, I would have to say the curriculum committee meetings have been excellent. Um, I love hearing um, from uh, the committee members. Um, Janet always goes, she's an alternate. Josh always goes, but um, it's great to sit in there and listen um, to what you guys were saying, because that is like where the real work and the real conversations happen about curriculum um, and all the additions that we are making and changes um, to adapt to the needs um, at the high school um, and different things like that. So I appreciate your time tonight and I appreciate your presentation and we'll await the budget presentation and, and <laughs> see how that goes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item seven, superintendent's report. Item A, student representative update. Who would like to start? Morgan. Okay, so we actually have lots to talk about today because it's a busy month in the high school. So first off, the Enfield High Student Council is now holding our second annual door decorating contest. It's a pretty big deal. If you get certain teachers involved, it's like a fight for it. Um, so students themselves will pair up with friends or just a group in general with the teacher and you are in charge of decorating a door. It can either be academic, it can be Christmas like last year with my science teacher or my Eagle Block teacher, we decided that we were gonna do a gingerbread house. So our entire actual like little wing turned into a gingerbread. We had like spots leading into the room. We had gumdrops like we had blow up gummy bears. We went all out. It's a huge thing that a lot of the students and teachers love to witness. This year, though, we are adding a little spin to it. The teachers are now getting a trophy that will be kept in their room all year long. And it will say, like, the, I believe it will say, like, a name or something on it. Um, I'm not sure. I have to talk to Ms. Dolan about that. And each person in the room will be getting a Dunkin' gift card. So that's that. The pajama day that happened last Friday was a hit. I mean, most of us show up in our pajamas anyway, but it was nice to see the teachers were participating. It was fantastic to look at. The EHS band and jazz band are having their concerts tomorrow night at the EHS auditorium. The concert will begin at 6.30. Cora's concert was last Thursday. Congratulations to anyone that participated and was there. I heard it was fantastic. The blood drive, so I don't know the exact day. We, the Enfoot High School held a their first annual blood drive of the year. We had, we collected over 47 units of blood, which is a new school record. Thank you, Mr. Barnes. We will have a holiday spirit day Friday, December 23rd. It's just show up in any of your holiday spirit gear. So I can't wait to see any, everyone dressed up. It is sponsored by Rachel's Challenge. So thank you for that. Senior parents and seniors yourselves, I know you are tired of the emails and the announcements for this, but I'm gonna call us all out today. We have cap and gown measurements this Thursday during all four lunch waves. An extra tassel will cost you $6, so if you would like an extra tassel to hang from your car or for photos, this is your opportunity. That same day at around 9.40 or during second period, we'll be taking our normal senior class photo in the gym. So make sure you look how you want to look for this photo. <laughs> um, and we'll see if we can spot ourselves in the yearbook, all 300 something of us. And now what everyone's been waiting for, the midterm schedule. <laughs> um, midterms will happen January 18th all the way to the 24th. There is a makeup exam day in there, which will be the 24th. 
Um, we have two exams a day, so like 1A, so January 18th is exam 1A and 2A. The 19th is exam 3A and 4A. Then the 20th is 1B and 2B. And our final last day of exams are January 23rd, which is 3B and 4B. Congratulations to all of the early grads that are leaving us January 24th or 23rd. I hope you have a great rest of high school career or your new beginnings. Um, the exam actual schedule is exam number one will take place from 7.26 a.m. to 9.45 a.m. Exam two will then take place from 9.55 to 12.10. And then there will be grab and go lunch, which will be 12.10 to 12.20. For the rest of the day, it'll just be makeup exams. So that's it. That's all I got for this week. Thank you, Morgan. Kayla? Okay, so girls basketball had a home game yesterday versus Ledyard High School, which they won, and have a home game today as well against East Hartford High School in the Enfield High Gymnasium. Freshmen played at 345, JV played at 515, and varsity started at 645. The indoor track team will have their first meet on Friday, December 16th, and Saturday, December 17th at Hill House High School, and they are also selling fan shirts until Sunday, December 18th. T-shirts are $10, long sleeves are $15, and sweatshirts are $25. If you would like to buy one, please contact Coach Mahler, an Enfield track athlete. Um, you can pay with either cash or a check made out to Enfield High School. The money will be going towards buying a timing system so we can host our own meets and invitationals at Enfield High. The Rachel's Challenge annual pancake breakfast is back and will be held on Sunday, December 18th from 7 to 11 a.m. at Enfield High. We will have pancakes, raffle baskets, arts and crafts, live music, and a visit from Santa. All money from the raffle baskets will be donated to Enfield Loaves and Fishes and the Little Sisters of the Poor. The Hobie Leadership Award winner and runner-up was announced last week. Congratulations to Alicia Lazat and William Bergman for winning this award. They will get the chance to attend the Hugh O'Brien Leadership Conference in June to learn about how to become a better leader at Enfield High. Um, the Enfield High hockey team participated in a jamboree at Enfield Twin Rinks this past Saturday and will play their first official home game on December 23rd at Enfield Twin Rinks, and the game will start at 7.50 p.m. The boys' basketball teams have their first home game against Maloney High School on Thursday, December 15th in the Enfield High Gymnasium. Freshmen will start at 3.45, JV starts at 5.30, and varsity starts at 6.45. Thank you, Kayla. Okay, item B. And thank you, Kayla. You just took away with something that I had to report. So there's Rachel's Challenge stuff in your packet. Good job. Um, and really quick, all Enfield Public Schools will release early with lunch on Friday, December 23rd, and schools will be closed on Monday, December 26th through Monday, January 1st for winter vacation and New Year's Day. Students and staff will return to school on Tuesday, January 3rd. I want to wish everyone a happy holiday and a healthy new year. Uh, one other quick reminder, since we're talking about winter events, um, as you all know, winter weather is here. This is my annual reminder. You have to go to school 180 days, and they have to be done by June 30th. So everyone who wanted me to cancel school on Monday, that's the reason why we had a delay. Um, just a quick update. Uh, I'll save the date. I know I've used this time to reference the my superintendent's advisory group. Um, because of the calendar, and as all you've heard of all the events throughout the month of December, it's not feasible. But I'll be sending something out in the next couple of days to save the date for, for the, our initial meetings with that group. And I want to take the opportunity to congratulate the Enfield High School football team, because we haven't met since Thanksgiving um, for winning the Route 5 rivalry trophy and taking it away from South Windsor. So. Congratulations, everyone. And that concludes the superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, item eight, audiences. Kathy? Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. We will um, allow four minutes tonight. The first speaker, Rob Anderson.
just remember to state your name and address. We on? Good. Good. Uh, Rob Anderson, 34 Bass Drive. Mr. Dresick, you said something I actually agree with. I know it's a, it was a shock to me too. You said we need to start thinking differently. I agree. We do need to start thinking differently. I don't have a whole lot of hope that that's going to happen. In your body language as I'm saying this, you're not on camera, but. I'm Mr. Anderson, you. could you address the board, please? Thank you. So I can't talk to the superintendent of schools? Usually when you come up, it's to address the board of education in front of you. with the student absenteeism. How does that compare to the surrounding towns? Do the surrounding towns have the same problems that we do? You got a great question. What are we gonna do about it? I, you're the only person I heard ask that question. I didn't, didn't see that offered up, so I appreciate you asking that. Yeah, I know, jokes, right? Mr. Hamry, with the question on the book issue, sent an email to all you guys, didn't hear back from most of you. Again, you spoke out, said none of those books are on the shelves in the schools. Again, you were wrong. Not only were you wrong, you insulted a woman that came up here to speak. You owe her an apology. I'm sure you'll have an excuse. But time after time after time, you take a stand, you say, this is not happening. And again, proven it is. You go after Janet Cushman. You try to get her censured, but you know that you can't, that was just a, a ruse just to get attention, supposedly. But what she's saying is happening. You're saying it's not. It's fine to be wrong, but you owe an apology to the woman that stood here, to, that spoke here. And in the future, if you're going to make a stand and you're going to say something like that, you better be damn sure you're right. You get the pizza thing. You came up here and said, that's not happening. You were wrong. The milk thing. I haven't spoken about that here, but you said the milk thing wasn't happening. Obviously that's happening. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Your time is up. Thank you. Liz Davis. Remember to state your name and address, please.
Liz Davis, and I reside at 201 North Maple Street. I have one question. Um, not sure if it was mentioned earlier because I did come in late. The free lunch, is that coming to an end or was it extended again? I know it was like a month to month. So I just wanted to clarify that because I know a lot of kids use, you know, the free lunch. Hmm. Also, I'd like to say, Mr. Herman, I want to thank you, Josh, for speaking up and for always being a voice. You know, it's pretty amazing. I, I watch the Enfield Republican Town Committee come up and praise the Enfield Republican Town Committee um, on their lies and act like they're not lies and then criticize our education system or criticize people trying to do what's right that actually has kids in the school system or try to criticize our leadership that's doing an amazing job. Frankly, I just think they're jealous. So with that said, I do want to thank you for... Um, being a voice and calling out, bluntly, the bullshit. Thank you. Because I watch a lot. I excuse me, can you stop that? Um, I want to keep your comments to yourself. Hmm. Liz, yeah. you can just talk to me. Please keep your comments to the audience to a minimum, please. Should be able to start my whole four minutes over. So what's amazing is we, we can have a couple church get together, which, you know what, could be a cult, could not, but normally when it's a few and they targeted the most vulnerable students in our community in schools, I think that's a bigger problem. And I'm happy that we do have Board of Ed members that look out for every student every day and we'll call them out on it, and that we do have eyes watching. So with that said, I am very thankful to have board members that stand up for every child every day and for the people that do come up that do not have children in our school system and I know you're a taxpayer you have a right blah 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 to speak great but if you actually had a child in the school system or tiny little bit involved in the public education school system you would know half of the BS that you come up and accuse our school system of doing that they're not doing. So maybe actually talk to people that have kids in our school system to get your facts straight before you come and just blow a bunch of smoke because you're jealous of other people. I um, feel sorry for you and I wish you good luck. And I want to say Merry Christmas to everybody and Happy New Year's. And um, happy holidays, because probably the next one will be after the New Year's. And let's hope the next New Year starts off where we all can actually put our children first, stop the political BS, and let's do what's right. Thank you. Okay, audiences is now closed. We will move on to board member comments. Ms. Sakri. I'm going to be reporting from the desk of Andrew Dupair, principal at Prudence Crandall. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving, Prudence Crandall hosted a parent engagement day with over 100 fam 150 families attending the event. They were able to complete an activity with their child in the classroom, and they got to meet a variety of community workers and organizations that attended this affair. The Crandall students took part in PJ Day for the, for the kids, and it was a great way for the students to honor the courage of children battling cancer. In the Crandall Barnard PTO meeting that was scheduled for December 15th has been canceled, and the next meeting will be held Thursday, January 13th, at 6.30 in the Henry Barnard Library. Mr. Dupere would like to, everyone to know that although the school is closing in on a vacation time, the teachers and staff are continuing to push students academically, building stamina, 
and engaging them in rigorous activities. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cree. Dr. Kalman. Um, so I'd like to start off with Head Start. Uh, the monthly policy committee meeting was held on December 2nd. Uh, a few of the highlights, the big news, is that Head Start just received a five-year term of accreditation from NIAC, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children. Uh, this is a really big deal. Uh, Jacqueline Valley and her team at Head Start didn't just pass the accreditation process. They, they absolutely crushed it. Uh, the overall pass rate was 94.9%. The scores for the 10 standards assessed were as follows. Relationships, 92%. Curriculum, 100%. Teaching, 95%. Assessment of child progress, 100%. Health, 83%. Staff competencies, preparation and support, 93%. Families and community relationship. These two, these were two, two, two separate standards, but they were combined because of small numbers. Uh, that was 100%. Physical environment, 89%, and leadership and management, 94%. So individual portfolios scored 97% for each of the five classes evaluated, placing them uh, within the top 25% of all NIAC classes evaluated. So that's just incredible. Uh, Enfield has a, a, a really premier Head Start program uh, that we should all be very rightly proud of. Uh, enrollment remains very high at 100 children. Very shortly, maybe already, uh, two additional students will be enrolled, bringing Head Start to its maximum capacity. There are six children on the income eligible waiting list and four children on the over income waiting list. Um, as you know, last month, the Board of Education approved the federal grant uh, for 2023 and 2024. The results of the DRDP, which is the Desired Results Developmental Assessment were reviewed. As of this fall, the assessment indicates that Enfield Head Start children are progressing normally toward kindergarten readiness in all domains of learning and development. Uh, no small, uh, that's no surprise at all. Uh, the current unit of study is buildings. Who builds them, what they are made of, uh, what happens inside of them. Uh, students are also learning concepts of emotional management, including how to name emotions. With respect to special education, there are two children with developmental delays, eight with speech and language challenge, excuse me, eight with speech and language challenges only, and seven with autism. Uh, 16 families participated in Ready Rosie activities last month. The playlist focused on boxes and buildings and on talking about uh, feelings, which dovetails with the Head Start curriculum. There were 22 referrals for energy assistance, six for food assistance, 20 to WIC, four for housing assistance, two for child care, and one for adult uh, education. Uh, Head Start is starting to utilize a family outcome tool in the course of home visiting assessments, taking note of such matters as emergency crisis intervention, housing, child education and development, par parenting, parenting education, health and dental issues, family support, and family engagement. So results of the outcome measures will be discussed with the families, including what referrals, if any, uh, should be made. Uh, regarding health, all students have received vision and hearing screens, and the school nurse is working on necessary referrals. Also, no student uh, will be allowed to return to Head Start on January 3rd without a flu vaccine. Proof of vaccination must be submitted no later than December 23rd, unless the family can present a note from their doctor that the child has an appointment after that date for a flu vaccine. Uh, plans are underway to start a seven week virtual circle of security series for interested parents and caregivers. Uh, as you know, this is a highly successful initiative that enables parents to understand the meaning of their young children's behavior in the context of the parent child relationship. With regard to Kite, the monthly meeting was held on December 7th. The big news is that after six years, Leanne Boyer will be stepping down as the leader of Kite. 
After a six-month transition period, she will be succeeded by Carol La Liberté, the Early Childhood Education Coordinator at Asnanta Community College. So congratulations to Carol. Uh, she's going to be great. She's, she's just a, a, a wonderful uh, kite worker. And thank you so much to Leanne for such inspiring leadership over the years. A kite has received a $50,000 grant from the Fund for Greater Hartford to continue its family engagement initiatives in partnership with the Gassell Institute of Child Development. Uh, the Community Conversation Committee has made plans for two spring sessions to address equity, inclusion, and diversity. Uh, the first meeting to be held on March 29th at Asnuntuck will focus on sharing and listening to ideas, and the second meeting will deal with possible actions to be taken. Uh, the Family Resource Center has been awarded a small grant to promote the Sparkler app, which we've already discussed at a number of board meetings. Uh, thus far, 28 Enfield families have already downloaded this very valuable app. The plan now is to work with the food shelf to offer the use of the app to the families the food shelf serves. February 24th will be the first meeting for this year's Parents Leadership Academy cohort. We look forward to seeing what particular project uh, they will end up choosing. People Empowering People is a program out of the University of Connecticut to empower citizens to work within their respective communities to bring about meaningful change. There is an Enfield branch, but it is in need of Spanish-speaking facilitators. So please contact the Enfield Public Schools if you would like to help. The 3 to 3 program will focus on a professional development initiative to instill pl playful learning into the early childhood curriculum. As Amy Whitbrow is fond of saying, the job of childhood is play. First readers will hold a trivia night on February 25th at Mount Carmel at 7 p.m. Uh, consult the First Readers uh, website. And finally, Rocking Chair Readers is coming back. The program features retirees who volunteer to read to preschoolers and kindergartners. It's a mutually beneficial enterprise. Both retirees and young children find the experience highly gratifying. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalman. Ms. Cushman? Michelle's, or Mrs. Middleton's um, presentation tonight was timely because tomorrow um, at 5 p.m. there's a virtual interactive learning session using the Connecticut Ed site to understand school and district performance. So Amanda, perhaps during your, I know you might mention it, but I just, if you could just connect families with how they can find out more about it if they're interested. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cushman. Mr. Hamry? <clears throat> okay, so let's start off with the JFK PTO activities. Uh, PTO meeting is happening tomorrow via Teams at 6.30 p.m. And you can find the uh, information for that PTO meeting at the JFK's Facebook page or by emailing jfkmiddleschoolpto at gmail.com. Uh, winter band concert is happening this Thursday in the auditorium at JFK, and that's uh, at 6.30 p.m. Uh, looking forward to that myself. Uh, term number two progress reports are available coming up this Friday, December 16th. Next Wednesday, December 21st, it's a fundraiser dinner at the Red Robin. Uh, we've all been to a Red Robin fundraiser, so I'm pretty sure that's a, a standard process and uh, it usually gets some good results for the uh, organization raising the funds. Uh, but there will be more details to follow on that. And I just want to pass out a thank you to uh, Leslie, the PTO president, Dr. Barrios, and everybody that's making that PTO run so smoothly and effectively for the uh, benefit of the entire school, particularly given the uh, challenges that they've had during uh, the last few years, as uh, we've just heard about earlier. Uh, a couple of things uh, I was able to attend recently. I I've been in uh, events at uh, the, at the Fermi Annex, uh, excuse me, Enfield Annex, at the uh, JFK Auditorium, at Enfield Highs Auditorium. And um, it's amazing. I was going to put this under the category of the ECAC later on, but this is uh, more relevant to the incredible talent that we have within this district in the arts, uh, music and um, band arts. 
So shout out to everybody involved <laughs> in the Enfield High Chorus and Orchestra Winter Concert. They did a fantastic performance. Uh, the Enfield Community Chorus that uh, had a, uh, a um, show last uh, so Saturday and Sunday, December 3rd and 4th. Uh, I was unable to attend another uh, event on the 4th because that one uh, coincided with, uh, and I'll talk about that in the CAC uh, comments. Um, but the uh, Enfield Community uh, Band concert was last night, uh, December 12th, at, uh, JF, um, at the JFK Auditorium, and it was absolutely amazing. It's worth noting that uh, among the community uh, concert band that ranges from uh, young high school to senior citizen range, there were, I believe, at least eight different students from Enfield High and JFK that were participating in that. I might be wrong about uh, the numbers or the uh, schools that they represent, but we do in fact have students that are represented and playing alongside uh, town residents that just want to get out there and perform. And they did an amazing job. It was so exciting. Um, to that point, I want to uh, thank uh, one of our school parents that uh, has students at both uh, JFK and Enfield High, uh, Eric Griffin. He's given me a lot of information over the last couple of uh, weeks since our last meeting, particularly about a program that I was not aware of earlier. Very excited to know about the uh, United Sound program. Uh, and this is a, a shame on me for not paying attention to my own child who was part of that process to bring this uh, thing to life last year while she was a student at Enfield High. Um, to those that are not familiar, the United Sound program is the high school students teaching special needs students how to read music, how to play their instruments, and are performing <coughs> together with them. And um, I do, again, I apologize that I was not aware of this prior to uh, Eric reaching out to me. Uh, but it is a new program this year, uh, and um, Mrs. Shell, the uh, music director at Enfield High, is the one uh, bringing that together. Uh, Eric has promised me to connect the dots so that I can get in on that and uh, at least maybe visit and watch uh, 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 practices or maybe the performances when they are uh, available. Um, so again, thank you to Eric on that one. And kudos to his, uh, his daughter, Harley, who's one of those that are teaching the students. So she's uh, not only playing the music and enjoying that, but she's helping teach uh, the special needs students the uh, instruments and how to uh, read the music. Uh, Dr. Callanan's given me quite a lot to, to uh, comment on because he had so many good things to talk about there. And kudos to the uh, district for the NIAC accreditation. Uh, I've been through accreditation process in the uh, previous roles in my, uh, my own career. And it's a daunting process, lots of paperwork, lots of coordination of uh, uh, departments and such. So to achieve accreditation at, and at the level that they did, that really is remarkable. So kudos to everybody involved that made that possible. Um, to that point, and I, I, someone, I apologize, someone mentioned the career re review process. Uh, um, excuse me, the curriculum review process. It was during the comments earlier about uh, curriculum that uh, as I got to sit in the, uh, these meetings, uh, it's it's remarkable to see the way these courses and the classes are being uh, developed to uh, reflect the moment, the um, motto of this district and to adjust for the changing times. I believe that's a, uh, a commendable uh, ongoing effort to bring out the best in uh, our uh, teachers so that they can uh, give our students the best footing possible to achieve everything that they want to achieve. So again, kudos to the curriculum process because uh, seeing the, uh, the level of expertise that comes out in those uh, conversations among the uh, educators that are uh, explaining to us the process, it's really uh, eye-opening. Um, one thing that uh, Dr. Kellner did mention is the uh, uh, housing concerns at the Head Start level. It is no lie, no joke, and uh, as I mentioned in past comments, I am a uh, uh, immediate a frontline worker with the homeless population. Uh, it is a real factor that uh, affects this town in a profound way at all generational levels. So to have that b being noted by Dr. Callanan at the Head Start level, uh, I assure you it's happening at every level in the schools, though I, I'm obviously not at, uh, at liberty to, to speak to any particular instances. Um, it's not a good time of year to be without shelter. 
and uh, the resources that uh, were there in the past couple of years due to the COVID funding is not there this year. The uh, people that you see outside are legit in most cases, and um, it's, it, it's good to know that uh, we do have the warming center open for those that are in need, and uh, kudos to Monica and the, the uh, volunteers that help maintain the warming center for those in need at St. Patrick's uh, basement, uh, open 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. That uh, for those that are in need of those services. Uh, kudos to everybody at the uh, food and uh, soup kitchen at uh, Loaves and Fishes, to the uh, programs that they run there, to the uh, exciting benefit that they had over the weekend, the first ever uh, talent show that benefited both the Opera House players and uh, the, the uh, Loaves and Fishes. And I'll save the rest of it for the uh, ECAC comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henry. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc? Um, the only thing I have tonight, and it, this doesn't even necessarily relate to our school systems, but I'll pass it along hoping that somebody hears it. And um, But I was at a couple of the basketball games over the past couple of weeks over at the Annex, and it'd be really appreciated if that floor could get waxed. Um, we have a travel program that plays all levels with the boys and girls and the floor does need some work so I'll pass my communication on but if somebody hears that tonight that would be great if the town could get that done there's also rec basketball rec basketball too yeah, yeah. thank you Mr. LeBlanc Mr. Unger so I saw a story a little while back here and um, it talks about a group of our students and um, I'd like to share that with us here this evening it says here best buddies middle school students spread kindness through inclusion a group of students at JFK middle school is dedicated to spreading kindness there are 44 students who are members of the school's best buddies chapter the JFK chapter is the largest one in Enfield and is only about 500 middle school chapters in the country. The 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students, advised by special education teachers Amy Santanella, Sarah uh, Simeone, 6th grade teachers Katie Fitzgerald and Samantha Hannigan, and guidance counselor um, Shannon Kudrick work together on projects that show kindness and promote their strong belief in inclusion. Uh, in honor of Giving Tuesday, the Best Buddies celebrated by giving other students in the school little strips of paper they made with kind sayings on them. While the JFK chapter sometimes works on simple projects like sharing kind sayings and making sure that no one sits alone at lunchtime, other endeavors take more time and effort. The students recently organized a food drive to help the needy at Thanksgiving. They collected 2,619 pounds of food and donated it to the Enfield food shelf in time for the holiday. Santanella said the food drive was entirely the student's idea. The best buddies collected the donations outside of the cafeteria for several months and advertised the drive with posters and school announcements called Fill the Boat. The chapter received a handmade boat created by JFK art teacher Lauren, uh, I hope I say your name right, Lauren, uh, Veturis, and her third period students to showcase the donations. Santanella said that it was a big hit and that the food of, of the food drive and that we have some wonderful families in the community. So I wanted to share that, the good things that this group is doing over at uh, um, JFK Middle School. And when I read this about putting kind things on a piece of paper, it reminded me of a story that ran in um, Reader's Digest many years ago. And I'd like to share that with uh, my board members and with uh, everyone here because it reminded me of this story in Reader's Digest. And uh, there was a, a discerning and wise middle school math teacher. And one Friday, this outstanding teacher gave her students a rather strange assignment for a math class. 
The assignment was to be completed that day before they were dismissed for the weekend. And she said, I want you to take out some note paper and I want you to list the names of all the other students in the class and leave a space between each name. Then I want you to think about the nicest things that you could say about each of your classmates. I want you to write those things down on the line below their names. At the end of the class period, she collected all the papers, and over the weekend, she wrote the name of each student on a separate sheet of paper and listed what everyone in the class said about them. And on Monday, she gave each student his or her list. She then watched as each pupil read through their papers. She saw some who whispered to each other, I didn't realize that so-and-so liked me so much, or I never realized how much that meant to them when I did this or I said that. She watched as the atmosphere literally changed in the classroom. And even though she never discussed the papers openly with them in the class, she knew that what she had done had been a huge success. She could just tell by their smiles and their demeanor that the exercise had given them a really good positive feeling about themselves. They left school that day encouraged and feeling good, and she left that day knowing that her exercise had been a success. She accomplished exactly what she'd hoped that it would. And several years had passed before she would come to excuse me, realize how successful it had been and how much of an impact it really made on those kids that day. Several years later, one of the students in that class, Mark Eklund, was tragically killed in war. Most of his former classmates, along with the junior high school math teacher, attended his funeral. At the luncheon following the service, Mark's father said to the teacher, I have something I want to show you. He took out a wallet out of his pocket and said, they found this on Mark when he was killed. And we thought that, you'd, that you might recognize it. Opening the billfold, he pulled, pulled out two worn taped sheets of notebook paper, which obviously had been folded and refolded time and time again. As Mark's dad had handed it to the teacher, she soon realized that it had been the list of the good things that Mark's classmates had written about him many years before when he was in her class. Mark's mother was standing by and said, thank you so much for doing that, for as you can see, our son treasured it. The teacher was deeply moved by that, but the story doesn't end there. To her amazement, each student there, Mark's classmates, spoke up, revealing that they too had kept those papers and that they too often read those comments. Some even still carried it with them in their wallets. Another student said, it meant so much to me, I put it in my wedding album. And then another former student said, I think we all saved our lists. And Mark took his lists filled with the right words, encouraging words, to his grave. I share this story to illustrate how powerful our words can be used to build, encourage, uplift, and strengthen others. In this holiday season, let us be mindful that our words can be as apples of gold and pitchers of silver. And with that, I'd like to wish all of our Enfield High School students, teachers, staff and administrators, a very Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and all the best in 2023. Thank you, Mr. Ungeyer. Ms. Pickett? Mr. Ungeyer, um, I worked for an organization and we did that as a staff meeting, um, and I kept that list on my refrigerator for probably years, um, and I know I have it somewhere, so um, that is an act that I'm sure teachers have used, um, and thank you for sharing that. I think it's an act possibly we should consider, <laughs> the nine of us. <laughs> I'm not joking, because I believe we all have positive qualities, so beyond what we're doing. And I don't think that's a bad idea for us to take the time to do before the start of the year. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Um, now to transition to more somber stuff that I just want to um, ensure that we acknowledge. Tomorrow marks 10 years since the tragic murders at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Um, if anyone is interested in supporting the families in ways that they choose, please visit mysandyhookfamily.org. 
Um, there is no one single organization that represents all the families. And on that website, you can read about each family contributes, how they want their loved one remembered, um, and information that they're willing to share. So I, I encourage folks, if you um, do choose to give tomorrow or remember those families, mysandyhookfamily.org is a great website to check out. Um, also, just want to make note, um, Lori Gates mentioned that all like the fire and police and stuff will be at the school, so it's already a heavy day. So just another reminder to families that um, that will be happening at our schools too, and it's not an emergency, it's a celebration and a remembrance of our veterans. Um, Enfield Street School. Thank you, Chef O, high school students, um, and the partnership with EHS. My kindergartner cannot wait to go make some cookies next week. Um, I love hearing about those partnership opportunities, so thank you so much, um, Enfield High, for being willing to partner with Enfield Street School Kindergarten. Um, we have the food shelf um, boat at Enfield Street School, so families, please um, send in donations. There are lots of upcoming events. Um, again, I'm going to highlight the principal newsletter and the Enfield PTO com website. We have Spirit Day on Friday, wearing your favorite holiday, winter, everyday headwear. Um, there's a PTO Winter Festival on Friday as well at 6.30. Um, and then next week on the 23rd, our half day is wear the color of your grade level, kindergarten green, first grade white, and second grade red. Um, I too want to comment on Dr. Kalman's report of um, Head Start and STEAM at Stowe. So Stowe will always um, hold a special place in my heart. Um, I always say that it's our gem. Um, I want to thank you, Jacqueline, and your entire staff for your consistent efforts um, and your accomplishments. That is no small feat. Um, and the data does not surprise me because you all are wonderful. Um, but that is definitely something to be proud of and to celebrate. Um, I think I snuck it in last meeting late, um, but I wanted to highlight again, Enfield Adult and Continuing Education sent um, everybody, every resident should have received that nice little booklet of offerings. Um, our adult and continuing ed offer a ton for our community and our families um, and our students. So please make sure you check out those winter and spring offerings. Um, I was able to attend the Torchlight Parade with my kiddos. Um, that parade is amazing. Um, there was great turnout. I would love to see that same turnout at all of our other parades. Um, so however we market and inform families of the Torchlight Parade, we need to follow suit with Veterans and Memorial Day and all of those other um, town celebrations that we have because families show up um, for the torchlight. Um, thank you, Janet. I had this in my notes, but tomorrow there is a presentation being offered by the state on EdSite, which is the public data website that Chris has mentioned, I've mentioned, Michelle mentioned. Um, so families, staff, really anybody who's interested to know about that website and how to access the data can attend this event. If you go to cpacinc.org, and click on the events tab, you'll see um, the event listed there and you can register. There is full translation as well, so families um, who might speak other languages, you can still access it. So that again is cpacinc, C-P-A-C-I-N-C dot org. Um, Thursday, this Thursday, the Festival of Trees um, at the library is being kicked off. Tessa and I have one there. Please go check us out. <laughs> um, and very excited for the opening night um, activities. And then I just want to end with a happy holidays as well. There are many religious and cultural celebrations during this time of year. I love seeing how my children are coming home um, with a greater understanding of all of these celebrations and able to share their own um, celebrations with their classmates. I hope everyone has a safe, kind, and responsible holiday season. Thank you, Ms. Pickett. Mr. Ryder? So I'll start with my updates for Eli Whitney. Um, the December PTO meeting has been canceled. We will meet again in January. I um, want to thank everybody who came out to the Pajama Jam last Friday night and shopped at our family book fair. Uh, families also purchased books to donate to the Connecticut Children's Hospital, and they were donated along with uh, the money that was raised from our raffles um, to PJ Day. Uh, students, again, just as a reminder, will be going outside to cheer the Reese Across America convoy at all schools tomorrow, so please make sure that they dress warmly. Um, specifically at Eli Whitney, they also have a boat uh, there at the school, and Friday is the last day to send in donations for the winter food drive to benefit both Enfield Loaves and Fishes and the Enfield Food Shelf. 
uh, Eli Whitney's Eli Whitney and Hazard Memorial School um, are doing a Spirit Week, which starts this Friday with Grinch Day, where you can wear green. And then next week, there's other days like Gingerbread Day, uh, Deck the Halls on Tuesday, Winter Wonderland on Wednesday, Ugly Sweater Day on Thursday. And you get to wear your PJs again for Polar Express Day next Friday. Uh, once again, that's at both sister schools, Hazard Memorial School and at Eli Whitney. Um, JFK update, I will save for our committee reports. I also wanted to call your attention, uh, EnfieldPTO.com, if you look at the calendars, you'll see on every school calendar on February 25th, that kite is bringing back the EPS Heritage Fair. That'll take place at JFK from 1130 to 4. Uh, but the reason why I'm bringing it up now is that you can go to EnfieldKite.org to sign up to be a free exhibitor at this event. So even though the event is coming up in a couple of months, and we'll talk about it more as we get closer to February 25th, I wanted to let anybody know that if you'd like to exhibit at that event, please go to enfieldkite.org to sign up for a booth. Whose thunder did I steal? Oh, no. <laughs> I hope to hear more about this from Mr. Hammer down the road. Um, so something else that has been very important to my heart, and I've done this for um, six years now, um, five as a board member and six as a PTO dad here in town is last Friday, December 9th, was our PJ day for CCMC, now known as just uh, Connecticut Children's. Um, so every, uh, once again, every student had the opportunity to uh, wear their PJs to school on Friday, whether they made a donation or not. Uh, we suggested an optional $1 donation, again, for the privilege to wear your PJs to school. And for the past five years, um, as Enfield PTO slash Enfield Public Schools has decided to be a team and not just individually fundraise as a handful of schools, but to actually work together as a district along with our partners at Smith Bussing and some local businesses. I can report tonight our totals, or at least our totals as of today, because there's still some late money coming in. So currently, our team here in Enfield um, is third in the entire state of Connecticut, only trailing Coventry, which is where PJ Day began 12 years ago, and West Hartford Public School District. And as you know, the last four or five years specifically, we've finished in the top five, but as of five o'clock this evening, we are number three in the state. Also, <clears throat> as this is an event that takes place statewide, this was the first year that all 165 towns and school districts participated. The entire state was filled in green as there was at least one school or business or town um, town entity that had signed up. So this is the first time that Connecticut as a state has provided with 100% participation. And we're still third. <laughs> and they've raised so far $345,000 as an entity um, since Friday. Our top three schools are JFK Middle School, Eli Whitney and Parkman, with strong and amazing performances from all of our schools, Prudence Crandall, Henry Barnard, Hazard Memorial School, Stowe, including ECDC, Enfield High, Enfield Street. Alcorn participated, um, both our central office employees and the ETLA students, which I got to visit with Kathy uh, last Friday. And I also wanted to thank our friends at Eagle Academy. So online, we have raised over $9,781 as a district. There's still almost $600 to be picked up in cash from folks that forgot on Friday or just wanted to make an additional donation on Monday or Tuesday of this week. So I'll be going around again to visit our schools. I left my house at 7.30 on Friday. I started at Eagle Academy. I went to Smith Bussing, I went to Enfield High, I hit every one of our schools, some of them multiple times, because the secretaries were so excited that they just found another $20 or another classroom, forgot to turn it in this morning with announcements and just brought it down to the office, can you please come back and visit us? We have raised as a district a lot of money the last five or six years, and last year was our best year yet, where we raised $9,411. This year, we have raised over $10,329, which is 9.76% over our record. I want to let everybody know that on EnfieldPTO.com, on the front page, the first thing you'll see is the logo for our Enfield 
EPS PJ Day 2022. And if we can find just 22 more dollars in donations, <laughs> just $22 in 2022, um, we can round that up to an even 10% and we can beat our best year yet by an even 10%. And so we're going to leave that link open through the rest of this calendar year. Uh, December 31st, we'll close it. Um, but again, if we could just raise another $22 this week, <laughs> we can say that we beat our best by 10%, a double-digit increase over last year. And I want to thank every student, every staff member, every faculty member that works in our buildings, especially our families. I had so many parents write a note with their $20 bill, and put a post in on it saying, even if anybody else in my son or daughter's class forgets they're covered, here's $20 from our family. Thank you for doing this. Um, I also want to say on EnfieldPTO.com, again, on the first page, there's a video, what we call a Flipgrid video. And there's a lot of messages, personal messages from our Enfield Public School students who are wishing well to these children that are fighting cancer at Connecticut Children's and that won't be home this December 25th, December 24th, Hanukkah, Three Kings Day, any of these holidays, they probably won't be spending with their families. Their families will come visit them one at a time at Connecticut Children's. So thank you to those students for those personal messages. Thank you to all of our staff. Thank you to our partners at Smith Bussing. Thank you to any local businesses that participated. And again, for 22 more dollars, we can say we <laughs> had a double digit increase over our best year yet. And I look forward to partnering a little bit closer with maybe the high school next year and maybe friends of Rachel, Rachel's Challenge, um, to get the high schoolers more excited. Um, they did very well, but they're so used to, again, wearing their lounge pants and sweatshirts <laughs> and PJs on, on any Monday through Thursday that maybe it wasn't as special for them last Friday. Um, but uh, thank you to everybody that participated. I'm so proud of our students and um, and our staff that was so passionate about this. And thank you to everybody that participated. Happy holidays to everybody and happy new year. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. Um, to start with, I think we should send Guy over to Enfield High. I wanna see those doors. I want him to take pictures and send us those doors. Um, I'd love to see them. If you ever need a tiebreaker, we have been known to get invited to judge, you know, mini me pumpkin contests and different things like, like that. say if you would like to see last year's door, look at the EHS student council page. There is plenty to look at. <laughs> if you miss what I just said, if you go on to Instagram, the EHS Student Council page, we have, we've been posting a lot, um, and you will see last year's winner and all of our other doors. Thanks, Ms. Dolan, for running that account now. Um, overall, it's, it's, I don't even know what to say, it's absolutely fantastic. I looked forward to it when they introduced it last year. I was like, ooh, this is going to be fun. But now it's definitely become a lot Thanks. more. Yeah. It's great. Thank you. Um, uh, the other thing, too, I wanted to mention, Mr. Hamry, um, United Sound, when you get information, if there is a concert or an event that we can attend, you know, please let us know. and Count um, on it. We'd be happy to attend. I can't wait to attend. Um, Wreaths Across America, um, I know I thanked um, Pam and Lori, but um, Wreaths is just a small snippet of what they do um, for the veterans and for our current enlisted um, soldiers um, in the town of Enfield. Um, Two Moms on a Mission is working very hard on their angel tree, and I just want to thank um, Lauren Andrews, Carrie Monafort, and the generosity of all the people who signed up to buy gifts for um, the Enfield um, Public Schools families in needs, um, and this is from the young kids up through the parents. I, um, I love the Torchlight Parade, too. I attended the Torchlight, uh, the Torchlight Parade, and I have to say that um, I think Tristan is giving Mayor Crisati a run for his money. Um, he showed up with a jacket with Christmas trees. It was a very uh, spirited um, suit jacket. And he didn't want to wear a coat because he wanted everybody to see his jacket. And he um, lit the Christmas tree. And it, it was amazing. Um, I love hearing all the carolers and seeing um, Santa and Mrs. Claus. Um, I also went to career day um, at Enfield High, which was the day after our last um, meeting. I want to thank Mr. Baldwin. Um, he had to have me in his room <laughs> all day. Um, and thank you to the Career Center. They had amazing um, 
careers. Like I was like, why am I here? They had a Lifestar um, pilot. Um, they had architects. They had engineers. It was uh, it was really a great um, event, and I think it was uh, very successful. So I was appreciative um, to be able to do that, and I can't wait to see what they do next year because I know they're going to take some some of what they did and and potentially. Um, improve, um, which would be hard to do. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, I would love to get the um, ECAC here potentially in February. Um, I want to talk about what we're working on on partnerships as far as the arts. Um, Mr. Rapucci is very excited um, about this, so I would love to hear um, some updates on the ECAC. Um, for Parkman, there is a virtual snuggle and read event on 12-19 from 6.30 to 7. And on January 7th, the PTO is having their Disney on ice night. And on January 10th, Parkman is having the Roar Assembly, and it will be Crazy Hair and or Crazy Hat Day. Um, I got an amazing email from a teacher and her cl his class at Parkman. And they feel that now that we're a one-to-one -one district... There's, they feel like there's too much paper usage in the town of Enfield. Not so much with the Board of Ed side, but with the town side. And they want to make that their project and they want to make it known, which I think is a great idea and just in time for the budget. <laughs> because we're sending, now that we're a one-to-one -one district, um, we don't really need to send home the flyers anymore. Um, you know, they'll, uh, they'll get a, the point was, there's a flyer that's out three different times that says we're online now. <laughs> so they felt that it was redundant. And I thought that was that was a really um, neat cause and um, something for them to look into and focus on. So I think that fifth grade class at Parkman. I would also like to congratulate um, Alicia Lazat, um, who is the winner of the uh, Hobie Award, and congratulate William Bergman, who is the runner up. Um, just to say a few things, this award recognizes leaders and promising high school sophomores. Hobie's purpose is to bring together a select group of high school sophomores who have demonstrated leadership, ability to interact nationally and internationally with renowned leaders. Um, the recommendation comes from the EHS admin and staff, and that's quite an accomplishment. So congratulations um, to both of those students. Let me see. I have a few different things on my list, so I want to make sure I capture any everything. Um, okay, so thank you, Amanda, for um, talking about Sandy Hook. I think that's one of the events where we're going to remember where we were that day when it happened. Um, but I would like to mention that um, one thing Amanda didn't mention is her involvement with the Anna Grace Project, um, which is a love wins movement, and it recognizes that all children and families have value, and so does their stories. So that hits close to home for Amanda, um, but I'd like you to check out the AnnaGraceProject.org and um, follow it on Facebook. Um, our friend does amazing updates and um, love does win. So I appreciate your work on the Anna Grace Project. Um, Amanda, I know you did not mention that. Let me just make sure I'm not missing anything else. Um, I did go to the girls basketball game last night. Um, they won against Ledger. Tonight was gonna be a tougher game. It was gonna be a conference game. I, I, I'm not sure if I got an update, so I don't know how they're doing. I'm looking for it. Oh, <laughs> um, there's a potential for one of the um, student athletes to reach her thousand point tonight, so that would be an exciting accomplishment for her. Um, also, that Route Five rivalry. Have you gotten the trophy back? Yes, we have. Well, you guys have it. Yeah. He wants it. <laughs> oh, I'm getting that. <laughs> that is staying in Coach Liver's room, or it will be returned. Never. We'll, we'll see. <laughs> it's not coming back to you. I remember the first time we won that trophy. Um, there were football players that drove around with it in their car in the in the seatbelt. So I'm thinking that's probably continuing to happen with that with that trophy. Um, yeah, it was a it was a great night. It was a great game, and uh, there was a lot of people there. I love that we played that on a Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, and. The last thing I want to say is to the entire district that I hope you have a safe, healthy, 
And happy holiday. I hope everyone gets some time to unwind, spend some time with their families, and um, just enjoy and live in the moment of the holiday season. I would like to extend to Jean, Janet, John, and Jonathan, and Josh, and Dr. Jerry, Amanda, and Scott, along with Morgan and Kayla. I just want to say thank you uh, for all the work that we do on the board, and um, have a happy holiday and a safe and happy new year. So I appreciate that. And that's all I have this evening. So item 10, unfinished business. We have nothing. Item 11, new business, adopt policy revisions, first reading, Mr. Ryder. So the policy committee members approved at our November 15th meeting to move forward four current policies with proposed revisions. Those policies, once again, were posted on our website for public input. Uh, these are 5113.2, 5141.4, 5142.2, 5143.2, 5144.2, 5145.2, 5146.2, 5147.2, 5148.2, 5149.2, 5150.2, 5151.2, 5152.2, 5153.2, 5154.2, 5155.2, 5156.2, 5157.2, 5158.2, 5159.2, 5160.2, 5171.2, 5172.2, 5173.2, 5174.2, 5175.2, 5176.2, 5177.2, 5178.2, 5179.2, 5180.2, 5181.2, 5182.2, 5183.2, 5184.2, 5185.2, 5186.2, 5187.2, 5188.2, 5189.2, 5190.2, 5191.2, 5192.2, 5193.2, 5194.2, 5195.2, 5196.2, 5197.2, 5198.2, 5199.2, 5200.2, 5201.2, 5203.2, 5204.2, 5205.2, 5206.2, 5207.2, 5208.2, 5209.2, 5210.2, 5211.2, 5212.2, 5213.2, 5214.2, 5215.2, 5216.2, 5217.2, 5218.2, 5219.2, 5220.2, 5221.2, 5222.2, 5223.2, 5224.2, 5225.2, 5226.2, 5227.2, 5228.2, 5229.2, 5230.2, 5231.2, 5232.2, 5233.2, 5234.2, 5235.2, 5236.2, 5237.2, 5238.2, 5239.2, 5240.2, 5241.2, 5242.2, 5243.2, 5244.2, 5245.2, 5246.2, 5247.2, 5248.2, 5249.2, 5250.2, 5251.2, 5252.2, 5253.2, 5254.2, 5255.2, 5256.2, 5257.2, 5258.2, 5259.2, 5260.2, 5270.2, 5271.2, 5272.2, 5273.2, 5274.2, 5275.2, 5276.2, 5277.2, 5278.2, 5279.2, 5280.2, 5289.2, 5290.2, 5291.2, 5292.2, 5293.2, 5294.2, 5295.2, 5296.2, 5297.2, 5298.2, 5299.2, 5300.2, 5301.2, 5302.2, 5303.2, 5304.2, 5305.2, 5306.2, 5307.2, 5308.2, 5309.2, 5310.2, 5311.2, 5312.2, 5313.2, 5314.2, 5315.2, 5316.2, 5317.2, 5318.2, 5319.2, 5320.2, 5321.2, 5322.2, 5323.2, 5324.2, 5325.2, 5326.2, 5327.2, 5328.2, 5329.2, 5330.2, 5331.2, 5332.2, 5333.2, 5334.2, 5335.2, 5336.2, 5337.2, 5338.2, 5339.2, 5340.2, 5341.2, 5342.2, 5343.2, 5344.2, 5345.2, 5346.2, 5347.2, 5348.2, 5349.2, 5350.2, 5351.2, 5352.2, 5353.2, 5354.2, 5355.2, 5356.2, 5357.2, 5358.2, 5359.2, 5360.2, 5370.2, 5371.2, 5372.2, 5373.2, 5374.2, 5375.2, 5376.2, 5377.2, 5378.2, 5379.2, 5380.2, 5381.2, 5382.2, 5383.2, 5384.2, 5385.2, 5386.2, 5387.2, 5388.2, 5389.2, 5390.2, 5391.2, 5392.2, 5393.2, 5394.2, 5395.2, 5396.2, 5397.2, 5398.2, 5399.2, 5400.2, 5401.2, 5402.2, 5403.2, 5404.2, 5405.2, 5406.2, 5407.2, 5408.2, 5409.2, 5410.2, 5411.2, 5412.2, 5413.2, 5414.2, 5415.2, 5416.2, 5417.2, 5418.2, 5419.2, 5420.2, 5421.2, 5422.2, 5423.2, 5424.2, 5425.2, 5426.2, 5427.2, 5428.2, 5429.2, 5430.2, 5431.2, 5432.2, 5433.2, 5434.2, 5435.2, 5436.2, 5437.2, 5438.2, 5439.2, 5440.2, 5441.2, 5442.2, 5443.2, 5444.2, 5445.2, 5446.2, 5447.2, 5448.2, 5449.2, 5450.2, 5451.2, 5452.2, 5453.2, 5454.2, 5455.2, 5456.2, 5457.2, 5458.2, 5459.2, 5470.2, 5471.2, 5472.2, 5473.2, 5474.2, 5475.2, 5476.2, 5477.2, 5478.2, 5479.2, 5480.2, 5491.2, 5492.2, 5493.2, 5494.2, 5505.2, 5506.2, 5507.2, 5508.2, 5509.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5586.2, 5587.2, 5588.2, 5589.2, 5590.2, 5591.2, 5592.2, 5593.2, 5594.2, 5595.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5599.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 5545.2, 5546.2, 5547.2, 5548.2, 5549.2, 5550.2, 5551.2, 5552.2, 5553.2, 5554.2, 5555.2, 5566.2, 5577.2, 5578.2, 5579.2, 5580.2, 5581.2, 5582.2, 5583.2, 5584.2, 5585.2, 5596.2, 5597.2, 5598.2, 5510.2, 5511.2, 5512.2, 5513.2, 5514.2, 5515.2, 5516.2, 5517.2, 5518.2, 5519.2, 5520.2, 5521.2, 5522.2, 5523.2, 5524.2, 5525.2, 5526.2, 5527.2, 5528.2, 5529.2, 5530.2, 5531.2, 5532.2, 5533.2, 5534.2, 5535.2, 5536.2, 5537.2, 5538.2, 5539.2, 5540.2, 5541.2, 5542.2, 5543.2, 5544.2, 
Against. Mr. Hamry? For. Madam Chair? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 12, board committee reports. Um, curriculum committee? <laughs> many. Um, I want to highlight, did you see next week is um, program of study night? No, February 1st. February 1st. Oh, I was wrong. Sorry. Oh, shucks. Why did I think it was next week? Sorry. Um, at our last curriculum meeting, which was last week, um, again, I want to thank Michelle Middleton. Um, a, we fit in a, a meeting quickly, um, and she did some significant revisions to the data presentation, um, which we, again, reviewed and had discussion about. So thank you again, Michelle. We also did some course adjustments and deactivizations. Um, I'm going to stress the importance of program of studies night, which is coming up in February, um, but all of that stuff is described um, in your program of studies night. We also, um, the our K-3 reading curriculum is on the agenda, and Field does um, have a, a deadline, actually the state, every district has a deadline regarding our selection of a reading curriculum. I'm unsure of that decision, um, but in looking in the data earlier, tier one means our core curriculum as well. So I will share with you that it's my hope that regardless of the decision made on the reading curriculum, that our teachers get professional development and support and evidence-based strategies of teaching students to read. All of our student, all of our staff need deep understanding of the science of reading, um, and I believe that's an important next step. Um, items from the table was tagged, so we will be reconvening and looking at budgetary constraints, but also programming um, reimagination. And our next meeting's in January. Thank you, Ms. Pickett. Finance Budget Committee, um, Dr. Jerry? Hold on, can we, can we go back for a second? Sure. I just, it, this is open-ended, but after reviewing the minutes of the curriculum meeting, can you just quickly go into detail on the, on the FACS and the business course deactivations? Mm -hmm. Notes. Um, if, you have, if, <laughs> if they're readily available. Yes. So some of the courses were redesigned. Um, hang on. I want to speak accurately. So can we either come back so I can grab my notes? Sure. Perfect. We'll come back to that, Mr. Leblanc. Okay. Um, Finance Budget Committee, Dr. Kalman. Uh, there is no meeting this month. Thank you. Policy Committee, Mr. Ryder. Uh, Policy Committee next meets on January 31st. Uh, the leadership committee, uh, leadership met uh, prior to this meeting. Um, we will be uh, moving our meetings to the Monday before our board meetings. Um, and we have three months worth of leadership meetings on the calendar. So I'm happy about that. Joint facilities committee um, met this week and we approved some invoices and um, you know, finishing up our projects. There was not much to report on the joint facilities committee. JFK building committee, Mr. Ryder. Uh, so the JFK Building Committee um, has sent communications to us as recently as today, I believe. Um, so we're looking at January 12th at 6 p.m. Uh, for the grand reopening of JFK. Again, that ceremony will be open to the public. So stay tuned to see if that date is 100% uh, confirmed. But we are looking at January 12th uh, at 6 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Ryder. I'm excited to have that event. A lot of people on Election Day were excited and wanted to know when the public could go ahead and tour the school. It's, it's amazing. Uh, Joint Security Committee, Mr. Ryder? Uh, we're meeting this Thursday. The Enfield Mental Health Wellness Work Group, Dr. Jerry? Uh, no report. Speaking of this, um, Mr. Dresick, would you be able to lead us in the right direction regarding school-based mental health um, centers? Um, yes just because it's something that Dr. Jerry um, would like to look into, so. I can give you some information for you. Thank you. The Enfield Cultural Arts Commission, Mr. Hamry. So ECAC met last week and we did discuss uh, several things, not the least of which was the Torchlight Parade and the, uh, the history behind it, what, how it works, how it develops, and how to uh, potentially uh, move forward with it in the future. Uh, and its involvement, uh, the ECAC's involvement in the uh, planning of it to see if, if it's something that can be expanded to a longer day, more events on the town green during the light hours and then the parade. So there's a lot of uh, discussion around that uh, in the uh, for future torchlight parades. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'd been to a lot of events in the, uh, recently in the town and 
Uh, one of the things that, uh, rather, at that ECAC meeting, rather, um, Amy Whitbrow had uh, attended and provided some information on the Heritage Fair. Thank you, Mr. Ryder, for <laughs> ripping that away from me. Um, and there's, yes, there is there is a meeting coming up on that on the 19th uh, next Monday uh, for the planning of that Heritage Fair. I, I've, uh, I've been in, invited to attend. I look forward to that. Uh, it's going to allow for a very good showcase of the new building that JFK is. Um, Amy brought uh, a flyer of the most recent one that took place in 2018, 19, that range. And on the back of it, there is the picture of the layout of the last time. And everybody remembers what that was like. Uh, I can still feel the springs in the auditorium seats uh, when we sat down in the uh, auditorium. Uh, and because of the events that I've been involved in over there, not not uh, not involved in, attended, uh, it just is an opportunity to just showcase everything that's good in that uh, building and in the community that uh, is going to be drawn out for the ECAC. Uh, and again, Dr. Kalman mentioned the um, people empowering people through UConn. Uh, that's just one example of a group that would be uh, well placed in this event, and uh, not to mention the larger variety of. Uh, Foods of uh, many cultures, looking forward to that. Um, I do want to uh, move to something um, regarding the, um, uh, moving away from the uh, Heritage Fair and the different events that I've attended. Uh, as a person that really appreciates the, the music and the uh, uh, events that are brought out, uh, I was called upon a couple of weeks ago to help out with uh, an event at Enfield High because the process of getting um, people to operate the equipment was uh, uh, not as solid as, as, a, as we would have hoped. Uh, Riley's Dance Studio had a recital there, two, two shows as a matter of fact, and um, there was a, a break in the uh, communications or something happened where the person that was supposed to do lights wasn't uh, available, and uh, I was asked if I wouldn't mind jumping in. So I, I did so because, uh, as I said, when I first showed up at the high school that morning, 20 minutes after I got the call, I said, the show must go on and I'll figure out what I'm going to be doing here as I'm doing it. Um, it highlighted a couple things that uh, caught my attention during those performances. And by the way, Riley's is amazing. The students, there's about 200 students that performed during those shows. And that's not a lot of room backstage that they have to work with. So that they did all this was just absolutely amazing. Uh, that they replicated in one of their uh, acts a uh, scene that I had seen just a month earlier down in uh, New York at the uh, Radio City Music Hall, the Rockettes, where they uh, did a spiral line kick. Uh, it was just amazing to see that replicated by students of uh, our town and uh, Riley's on our stage at Enfield High. Uh, so kudos to them. They had, uh, again, 200 students, the first show drew about 400 attendees, and the second one was at capacity for that auditorium, which I believe is something in the event of, uh, in the neighborhood of 700 people. So we have the capacity for a lot of people to take advantage uh, of the talents uh, of our uh, towns, uh, town rather. And, but it highlighted that we have a lot of equipment that we've invested in in that room, and I understand is being invested in JFK's auditorium and what seems to be a lack of uh, solid and reliable, not, not to take away from anything that's been in place and people that have done the work in the past, but a solid and reliable uh, network of people that can help run those important things like uh, at Enfield High, the students are the LSV, the lights, sound, and video. Uh, those folks that make the technology piece of the show is possible. And um, I don't know if there's a, uh, anything in the budget as we are looking at that in the coming year, but through the chair to the superintendent, um, just a curiosity if there's anything that can be uh, included to make sure that there's somebody that would be reliably in place. And again, not to diminish, or maybe there's somebody already in place to do this, but that LSV piece uh, is going to be a big factor in making sure that all the equipment that, that we have is, is uh, being put to use and uh, to the fullest potential because it's amazing equipment that we have. Um, again, a little bit off topic there, but uh, <laughs> uh, that, would, that brings me to back to the policies on equipment use. Uh, and the facility use uh, of, of the uh, different uh, locations, there's some inconsistencies in the facility use uh, as it applies to different organizations, whether profit or nonprofit, throughout the uh, uh, 
town facilities. Um, last of all, not least, but uh, Amanda did mention the uh, Festival of Trees. <laughs> yeah. And I think this is our third or fourth year participating in that as a family, but the ECAC did put that together a tree there as well. And uh, I would encourage everybody to uh, view, uh, view those uh, uh, displays at the public library uh, where uh, Jason is one of the uh, um, biggest supporters of the uh, ECAC as a liaison through the town. So uh, that's it for the ECAC. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamry. Uh, Tina, can I answer John's question? Found Perfect. my notes. Um, so a new course was added, Interior Design 2, which um, creates um, an internal Enfield High pathway option for um, internal design. The course deactivations were Business Management, Intro to Computer Science, Independent Living, and Career Planning. And we had discussion around those and how this decision gets made. One is around course enrollment, so kids just lack of enrolling in the course. Um, the other pieces, we've added so many courses where much of the content that was taught in these courses actually live and breathe in other courses um, that the students are signing up for and taking. Um, so we went through kind of what were these courses about, where do those kind of live in other courses. So for example, for example, a lot of family and consumer science courses, personal finance course, um, our career center and school counseling department is doing a lot of what like the career planning course was about. Um, and the important note to say why we deactivate and we don't delete a course is because we have to keep them in our record. So if a student needs transcripts or things like that, we have a record of the courses that we taught. And I'm looking at you, Mr. Longy, because I know you were at the high school and I'm just looking for the head nod. I just want to add that I forgot my comments. Um, SafeGrad would like to thank everyone who helped with the auction, the donations. They had a very successful event. And so for the seniors, Kayla Morgan, if you're going to SafeGrad, uh, they did extremely well um, that evening and I'm happy for them and they thank the community for that. Um, and the last thing they were just going to tell me was the fact that you guys are getting uh, measured for your gowns. So but you guys covered that So on Thursday. Um, so that's it, yeah. Yes, please. So we had we had yesterday um, scheduled a field trip. We're working with John Dag and and uh, Caroline Marr, uh, Buzz Robotics, the robotics group. We had yesterday had it all planned. Uh, we're going to get the bus at uh, seven forty five and head out to the Boston area, Boston Dynamics, Transcend Air, and we were all ready to go. Every student who was uh, eligible signed up for the trip, wanted to go. And then we got the snow, of course. So um, we're working now to reschedule. We reschedule that, and uh, so we're trying for um, actually um, next Tuesday, the twentieth. Thank you. Um, I'm excited to hear about how uh, this field trip went, and we will all hope there is no weather next Tuesday. We're so. On a presentation to, to give you back. Perfect. Yeah. No. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, item 13, approval of minutes, regular Board of Ed meeting minutes, November 22nd, 2022. Do I have a motion to approve? Moved. Moved by Ms. Pickett. Second by Mr. Seconded. By Mr. Ryder. All in favor? Item 14, approval of accounts, of accounts and payroll. Uh, no report for this month. <laughs> Thank you. You got your Christmas present bag? Item 15, correspondence and communications. Mm -hmm. There is nothing. Item 16, uh, Mr. Dresick, do we have a need for executive session? Okay. Item 17, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Hamry, second by Ms. Pickett. All in favor? Happy holidays. Happy holidays.